Web Summit's massive. I mean, the ability to sell our vision to a crowd of 18,000 people, it was very cool. The experience has been amazing. We created great connections with people. You know, we hope that you know we're a good alumni to show all the different stages that a young company goes through. Every time we come here, we learn something new, something more, and you know, we we kind of Pitching on center stage was amazing. You know, the exposure in front of 15,000 people, but also you guys brought some of the best investors here. I am tired of people saying they just can't find good diverse entrepreneurs to fund. We can address a lot of that by coming to a conference that has invested the time to make sure you've got diverse people here to network with. The winner of the pitch competition was able to capture the imagination of if this works, it's going to be really big. I think it's a huge opportunity for people who are just starting up their companies to meet the most interesting people. I'd encourage every startup to get involved. It's a unique opportunity to meet here in Hong Kong, where East meets West, Old meets New. This is the place to come to see the best new startups across Asia. This is the hottest emerging area in the world right now. To have a conference of this size that brings talent of this quality from all over the world matters a lot. It reminds me of something out of Star Wars, like a city of the future. We live in a world where innovation is actually on the rise everywhere. For me, there's hope for the future. In this new generation of people, new generation of companies, it is changing the world of technology. It's changing the world.
something bigger than just what they're working on. This is the biggest opportunity. This is hope. Across the vastness of time, the future calls out to us. And we must answer. Wipsum was massive. I mean, the ability to sell our vision to a crowd of 18,000 people was very cool. The experience has been amazing. It created great connections with people. You know, we hope that you know, we're a good alumni to show all the different stages that a young company goes through. Every time we come here, we learn something new, something new. Pitching on center stage was amazing. You know, the exposure in front of 15,000 people, but also you guys brought some of the best investors here. I am tired of people saying they just can't find who the diverse entrepreneurs can help. You can address a lot of that by coming to a conference that is investing. Make sure you've got diverse people here to network with. The winner of the pitch competition was able to capture the imagination of if this work, it's going to be really big. I think it's a huge opportunity for people who are just starting up their companies to meet the most interesting people. I'd encourage every startup to get involved. It's a unique opportunity to meet here in Hong Kong where East meets West, Old meets New. This is the place to come to see the best new startups across Asia. This is the hottest emerging area in the world right now. To have a conference of this size that brings talent of this quality from all over the world matters a lot. It reminds me of something out of Star Wars, like a city of the future. We live in a world where innovation is actually on the rise everywhere. For me, there's hope for the future. This new generation of people, new generation of companies, it is changing the world of technology. It's changing the world. Imagine for a moment that future generations could reach back in time to speak to you. What would they say? Would they despair? Stop. You've no idea what's yet to come. Or would they give hope? Never stop trying for a better tomorrow. Keep imagining, believing, dreaming. Would they tell us of new machines, the secrets of progress? Would they plead with us to care for our world? The very nature of communication will grow in ways you can't possibly imagine, and it will change us forever. 
These companies have incredible power. You've got to hold the companies to account. Data demands that there be regulation. It's not being seen to do the right thing. It's about actually doing the right thing. This future is arriving so fast that it becomes increasingly difficult to say what shape it will take. The tools that we've created have been turned by others into weapons. Here's the problem. Facebook, it has so much power. It is making a digital clone of our society. We cannot remain silent in this century. We need to do a better job of creating a really safe and inclusive workplace. Build teams of people who believe in something bigger than just what they're working on. This is the biggest opportunity. This is hope. Across the vastness of time, the future calls out to us. And we must answer. Web Summit's massive. I mean, the ability to sell our vision to a crowd of 18,000 people, it was very cool. The experience has been amazing. We created great connections with people. You know, we hope that, you know, we're a good alumni to show all the different stages that a young company goes through. And every time we come here, we learn something new, something more, and, and we recalibrate. Pitching on center stage was amazing. You know, the exposure in front of 15,000 people, but also you guys brought some of the best investors here. I am tired of people saying they just can't find good diverse entrepreneurs to fund. We can address a lot of that, I think, by coming to a conference that has invested the time to make sure you've got diverse people here to network with. The winner of the pitch competition was able to capture the imagination of if this work, it's going to be really big. I think it's a huge opportunity for people who are just setting up their companies to meet the most interesting people. I'd encourage every startup to get involved. Please welcome to the stage Managing Director of Techstars Toronto and the co-host of Collision, Sunil Sharma. Oh, there's people here. Oh, amazing. Okay, good morning everyone. Uh, welcome to the first day of Collision, which of course is uh, taking place in this incredible city of Toronto for the very first time. Uh, my name is Sunil Sharma. I'm the Managing Director of Techstars Toronto. Techstars is the worldwide network that helps entrepreneurs succeed. And I'm also, I also get to be the co-host of this amazing conference, Collision. So uh, a lot of excitement's happening in the tech community in Toronto. For those of you who were here last night at opening night, we heard all about it from the likes of the mayor and the prime minister that Toronto is really a city on rapid ascent in the tech community and uh, is showing its leadership around the world. 
Uh, many of you might be surprised to have learned, as we talked about last night, that this city has led all North American cities in tech job creation, even San Francisco. Uh, and so over the last five years, we've just really been on a tremendous course. Later on, <clears throat> on this very stage, you're going to hear some, some fantastic keynote pre presenters, keynote speakers uh, like Joseph Gordon-Levitt. Uh, we have the co-founder of Twitter, Ev Williams. So this stage is going to be um, just a power-packed uh, location for the duration of the day and, and in the subsequent days. But before that, we have a, a great treat for you. We're going to, um, ev every morning on this stage, we're going to introduce to you some of the most up-and-coming <clears throat> seed stage startups you'll find anywhere. And uh, so you're going to meet companies that are scaling incredibly rapidly. And the question will be, are these going to be the, the very companies that the world is going to talk about in 2020 and beyond? Many investors who are here, there's more than 800 uh, tech investors in the building uh, over the course of the next couple of days, uh, believe these are, in fact, those companies. So uh, we want to introduce to you uh, our very first company uh, on stage. These, these, these founders are eager to come out from backstage and tell you their stories on how they did it. So let's get started. Our first company is Hugo. Hugo's built a platform for your team to save and share meeting insights in real time. To hear more, please welcome the co-founder and COO, Darren Chait, to the stage. We discovered something interesting in building a business. How you meet determines how you work. It's no surprise, meetings influence everything. That's where decisions happen. That's where tasks are generated, knowledge, culture. Think about all the time you spend in meetings. Problem is, the way we meet is broken. Why? Because there's no connection to the way we work. Think about how we work in 2019. The average company is using more than 128 different SaaS tools. More than 90% of them are specific to one department. And at the same time, three quarters of millennial managers have a team that's part remote. What does that lead to? Data fragmentation and people fragmentation. That's why we built Hugo. Compare these trends in how we work with how we meet. Most meetings we attend end up with nothing decided. Hours of your time of no value to the people out of the room. So we take pages of notes, we send emails, Slack messages, action lists. All you end up with is isolated documents and gigabytes of data. And at the same time, it's near impossible to translate meeting takeaways into action. 128 different SaaS tools, people all over the world, different buildings, time zones. So Hugo solves that. We make connected meeting note software, centralized, searchable meeting notes that connect with your favorite tools. We turn the simplest activity, taking meeting notes, into an easy way to connect everything about the way you meet to the way you work. Here's how we do it. You take your meeting notes in Hugo. We help make those insights shareable and actionable in more than 20 of your favorite business apps. You can create a Trello card, sync to Salesforce, send a bug to engineering, share insights via Slack for those who weren't in the room directly from your notes. Then, after being shared with others in the business who weren't in the room and should know, we transform your meeting insights into organized product and, and customer intelligence that will never get lost. We're built on top of your calendar, so it's easy to make meeting notes centralized and easily accessible. And we organize them by customer, company, tag, project, however you organize your knowledge. And remembering how you meet determines how you work. Hugo powers the right process. With the likes of team templates and collaborative agendas, everyone in the business meets prepared and in the know every time. Best of all, talking to our customers, companies all over the world, we are being successful at completely destroying team silos. Check it out, hugo.team. Thanks very much. Yep. OK, we're now going to hear from One Health Company. They brought precision therapies uh, to, uh, that have been used to treat humans to apply to dogs who are suffering from cancer. So please, I'd like to introduce the CEO and founder, Christina Kelly Lopez, to the stage. Thank you. 
Good morning, Toronto. I'm Christina Lopez, CEO and co-founder of The One Health Company, and our mission is to cure cancer in dogs. Six million dogs were diagnosed with cancer last year in the U.S., versus one and a half million people. The incidence and prevalence is very high, but what is worse is that there are few options. They are inefficacious and toxic. We should know our Cosmo was one of those six million. And families like you and I are spending on our pets like a family member. To revolutionize this and bring canine cancer care to the 21st century, we introduced PhytoCure, the first targeted precision medicine for dogs. We genomically test the tumor, then we report the findings for you and your vet, and we enable with your vet precision therapies, targeted therapies, the most cutting edge, all at a fixed cost. And we have some early successes to share with you today. Cosmos, excuse me, Forest, Golden Retriever, nine years old, the most aggressive cancer, one to two months to live, and rodent phytocure, 10 months in remission. Lulu in Colorado, mast cell tumors, was having side effects, very toxic treatment, in rodent phytocure, and is now without her tumors. Toulouse, flew from Switzerland to get care in the U.S., had already failed chemo and radiation, is now without metastatic disease. And our paw print in the U.S. is growing, and hopefully it will come international. And the data, what we learn with each dog, deepens our data set. And humans and dogs have co-evolved and shared this terrible disease. Large Pharma has recognized this, so we partner with them and embolden the data set, hopefully to bring cures to humans too. Our capital partners, Andreessen Horowitz, Lair Hippo, Y Combinator, come join us in this fight. I welcome you, and thank you for joining. Amazing. Next, we're going to hear from a software as a service company that's built an advanced SaaS management platform that will increase the velocity, the agility, <clears throat> and the efficiency <clears throat> excuse me, of your IT operations. To tell us more, the CTO has come all the way from Tel Aviv, Israel. Please welcome Tal Beresnitsky to the stage. Hey. Good morning, everyone. I'm Uri, and I'm the CEO and founder of Dory. I built three companies in the past 10 years, bringing them to great success. The last one, House Party, is being used by millions of users around the world. Two years ago, when coming to build Tory, I had three things in mind. I knew I want to solve a big nagging problem that is only getting bigger. It needs to be in a way that is innovative and new. And above all, it needs to be simple. And that's why I started Tori. And in the past decade, the world has moved to SaaS. And we've seen tremendous things and growth it brought to us. It's safe to say that almost all of us here are building SaaS, sexy, fancy SaaS tools. But something less sexy left behind. And that's the way we manage them. Think of the IT. Their job was always hard. But today, they still find it hard to answer very basic questions around the SaaS tools, like what tools are we using? How much are we using them? And how much are we paying for them? Ask any CIO how many applications are being used in the company and get two answers. One of them is, I don't know. And the other one is a large enough variance, which is pretty much, I don't know. And not managing these tools correctly means that you're either wasting money, wasting time, you have risk exposures, or you're just not being productive. And this is where Tori comes in. We are a SaaS management platform. We directly connect to all our customers' SaaS tools, providing them with complete visibility of everything they need to know around their SaaS applications. On top of that, we build a layer of insights to get them the right actions they need at the right time. And a few months ago, we started with 
the powerful workflow automation process when they can actually workflow all the tedious work around managing all these tools. Tori can be implemented in less than 15 minutes. It can discover more than 10,000 tools and connect to hundreds. We built a superstar team to take it to market, and we have the best customers in the world, and they just love Tori. And I'm super thrilled to announce that we just completed a round of funding of $3.5 million from the greatest investors in the industry. And that will help us take Tori to the next level, because in the future, software will be managing software, and that's Tori. Please come and see us tomorrow at the booth. Thank you, everyone. OK. Our next company offers their customers a collaborative data platform that helps companies build more valuable partnerships. So to tell us about the potential of his company, please welcome co-founder and CEO of Crossbeam, Bob Moore. Techstars Toronto and the co collision. Jeffrey is going to take your mic off of your Thank you and good morning. My name is Bob Moore, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Crossbeam. Crossbeam is a collaborative data platform. We serve as an escrow service for data that helps companies that are collaborating with one another identify overlaps in their data and take action on those overlaps without worrying about letting the underlying raw data pass through to their partners. This solves an extremely important problem in the landscape of modern collaboration between companies, whether it's technology partnerships, platform partnerships, or channel partnerships. And that problem is the classic prisoner's dilemma problem from game theory that makes it so hard to answer simple questions like, how many customers do we have in common and who are they? Or are my sales reps selling to any of the same people that your sales reps are selling to right now? The issue is that you can't draw that Venn diagram unless you have both of the circles until Crossbeam came along. Crossbeam sits in between these companies and helps them identify the intersections in their data while keeping the rest of their knowledge and data private and secure. It's really simple. Companies connect their CRM systems or other sources of truth, define segments in their data that are relevant to their collaboration with other companies, partner up like LinkedIn for data, and ultimately find use cases for growing. Those use cases go up and down the entire revenue funnel, from identifying net new leads that partners can help to activate and bring online, to accelerating sales through motions like account mapping and co-selling and co-marketing activities. Also, it helps people prioritize their partnerships in the first place. What technology integration should I build next? What's the size of the potential addressable market if I were to collaborate with partner X, Y, or Z? Crossbeam is live now. It's free to sign up and join the network. And we hope that we can bring a ton of value to your company and your partnerships. Thank you all so much. Come see us in the beta exhibitor section. Thanks. So our next company is called Flipped. And Flipped is on a mission to help us all lead more digitally balanced lives. Uh, deal with things like iPhone addiction and just general device addiction while building now a digital wellness company. Please welcome to the stage the co-founder and chief marketing officer, Alana Harvey from Flipped. Digital wellness. It's a $600 billion market that's exploded from nothing in just the last 10 years. You'd think then that we'd all be a lot happier, right? Actually, in that same amount of time, our happiness has been declining. It seems that the more time we're spending on our screens, the less happy we become. In fact, our, we are the unhappiest we've been in the last 30 years. Why is this? Time. Researchers have found that the average person is spending all of their leisure time engaging in unhappy digital experiences. That means that there's less time to focus on the activities that are good for our overall well-being. So let's take a look at that $600 billion digital wellness market. It's a mess for the average consumer to navigate. You have to browse the App Store, download an app, create an account, start a free trial, 
try the content, only to discover that it's not the right fit for you and start this process all over again. This is frustrating for consumers, it's unfair for content creators, and it's not making any of us any happier. Flipped solves all of that. At Flipped, we're making digital well we're your gateway to digital wellness all in one place. We make it easy for you to focus on the activities that make you happy, healthy, and productive, whatever they may be. And we partner with the leading wellness content creators from around the world, like Slumber for Sleep Stories, Brain FM for AI-powered brain music, and even Toronto's own Keo for motivational podcasts. At Flipped, we're helping first-time wellness consumers become wellness experts. And since we launched, we've grown to almost a million users completely organically. We've grown our monthly revenue by eight times since this time last year. And we've helped power over a billion mindful moments for our community. Flipped is making such a powerful impact that we've been featured by the likes of the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Wired, and even Oprah. And our happy users, well, they speak for themselves all over social media. So if you're into digital wellness and you want to make it a more accessible experience for everyone, then come talk to the Flipped Wellness team. We'll be at booth B152 this Thursday giving away free self-care assessments. Thank you. Great job, Alana. Okay, coming up next is a company that will combine natural language processing with a network of experts who will evaluate the veracity of scientific work. Let's hear more from the co-founder and CEO of Sight AI, Joshua Nicholson. Hello, everyone. I'm excited to be on this big stage because I have some very, very big news to tell you. We've cured cancer. No one's clapping because internally you're all probably thinking, that's bullshit. And it is bullshit. We haven't cured cancer. We have looked at cancer. This is actually my work from finishing a PhD about four years ago. Is this bullshit? It's much harder to tell when the claims look like this. And this is a real scientific paper. You look at the journal brand, you look at the citations, and you look at the institutions. What about this paper? It's in the world's best journal. It's been cited a thousand times. It's informed six different clinical trials. Is this bullshit? How do we know? At Sight, we're building a way that you can look at any scientific paper, consequently any scientific person, to see if they're full of shit, uh, to see if they've been supported or contradicted. We do this uh, by analyzing the citations that papers receive using a deep learning model to say, is this supporting, contradicting, or mentioning? So you can see that my work has been supported three years later uh, by an independent group. Or you can see that this work, uh, which has all failed those clinical trials, has been contradicted. So where are we today? We've done 236 million citation statements. Uh, we are ingesting 1,000 documents a minute, so basically every scientific paper there is. Uh, it's 20 million citations a day. And, and most importantly, scientists are using us. So we're only two weeks old. Uh, we don't have all this funding and a lot of press coverage, but maybe that'll change after this. So thank you very much. Maybe it will. OK. We're going to now move into the construction tech industry. And we're going to meet a company called Roofer. Roofer is a marketplace for roofing, which will utilize satellite data and imagery for instant roofing estimates. So to tell you more about this big idea, please welcome the company's co-founder and CEO to the stage, Richard Nelson. Hey, everybody. By a show of hands, how many people have had to replace their roof or repair it? Holy shit. Um, OK, I didn't think there was going to be that many. So obviously, you've probably all gone through the, the horrible experience of doing this, and we're trying to change that. So getting a roofing estimate typically takes weeks. We do it in 30 seconds. Homeowners can go online, enter their address, within seconds get a quote. We're typically saving consumers, on average, 20%. Our mission is to ensure that every homeowner has access to protect their home with an affordable roof. Now, what do we do for roofers? We're building a platform that helps them manage their entire workflow. We give them free leads, free satellite measurement software, 
Um, we're launching a business loans product that they're able to get access to a line of credit in under three minutes. And they purchase their materials directly through Roofer at a potentially cheaper rate. Now, this is actually a massive market. Over 5 million buildings have their roof replaced every single year. And our investors believe it's a massive market as well. We've seen in investments from Y Combinator, Crosslink Capital, and many others. Now, currently, we're live in five markets across North America with plans to launch nationwide in the next five years. That's all I have for today. If you guys are interested in come talking to us, come see us in the booth. Thank you. So we're going to move into the vertical of prop tech. Our next company is called Lane, and they enable people to have a beautiful office experience. Uh, they provide connection, community, and streamlining to office life. So please welcome the CEO and co-founder of Lane, Clint Robinson, to the stage. Hello, Toronto. How awesome is it that Collision chose Toronto, Canada to have this year's conference? Isn't that fantastic? I'm Clinton Robinson, co-founder of Lane, and we're a workplace experience platform. And that was actually the end of the deck, so I'm actually going to have to go all the way back. Um, I guess I'll just wing it? All right, fantastic. Uh, so we're a workplace experience platform, and we turn any workplace into a place that works. And why is work? Oh, fantastic. There we go. Beautiful. Thank you. OK, why is workplace experience so important right now? Well, there's a new workforce, and they work in a radically different kind of way. And if you want these people to come work with you, you're going to have to offer them a very different work day. They expect great services and amenities. And most importantly, they expect technology to exist everywhere and to make their workday as easy to use as everything else in their life. So why is it so hard to create a, a great workplace experience right now? Well, the ecosystem is complex. It's fragmented. It's outdated. There's a dozen stakeholders in my office alone, from uh, the building owner to the property manager to the vendors and services and to the building management. They're all using outdated software. None of it works together. So that's why we created Lane, an intelligent platform for providing beautiful workplace experiences. What if every person, as they go to work every day, could be more productive because things were easier to use? Or what if we could make you a bit happier because we removed some friction out of your life? This is what Lane does. So from the moment you get in through the front door to maybe how you book your monthly parking pass, to how you register guests or book rooms, or maybe it's been a hard day and you want to book that wellness program, or you've run out of time today and you need to get that project done and you want lunch delivered right to your desk. All of this is available through one intelligent platform. And for those stakeholders I talked about, the value for them is now they have this intelligent platform, they're collecting data and analytics, and they're learning how to provide better service and, and improve experience at every office. So we're really excited. We've been blown away by how fast we've grown. It seems like a year and a half ago, we were just in Toronto. And now we power over 1,500 offices across a dozen major cities. And we are growing our team right now. So if you want to come work with us and change how the world works, please come talk to us. We're out at the, the Bader Exhibitor stand right now. Thank you. I'm Clinton, and this is Lane. Good save. Thanks, All right. So we'll move into AI, which is uh, what's making Toronto famous around the world. VoiceFlow uh, will help people design, prototype, and build voice apps without coding. And when you consider that Amazon has sold more than 100 million Alexa devices, you will certainly get an idea of why there's no limit on what this Canadian company is set to achieve. So to hear more about their plans, please let's welcome the CEO and co-founder of VoiceFlow, Braden Ream. Hi, everyone. My name is Braden. I'm the CEO and co-founder of VoiceFlow. One year ago, my co-founders and I had just finished our first businesses, and we were looking for what's next. 
And so we started to ask ourselves, what are the big new emerging tech trends? At the time, one of us had a smart speaker, and we thought it was interesting, so we started to play around with it. And so we started building interactive children's stories on Alexa. We would actually write them ourselves. We'd drive them around on our bikes in Toronto delivering them. And we actually end up building a really popular Alexa skill called Storyflow. Now, we actually had a big problem with Storyflow in that it was so popular we couldn't produce voice content fast enough. And so after hiring a couple of our friends and trying to set up almost like an assembly line for this process of designing it, scripting it, building it, and then testing it, we decided to build our own internal tool. We tried other tools on the market, but nothing was built for professionals to design and develop voice apps. Today, that internal tool we built is VoiceFlow, and it's used by over 10,000 designers and developers since launching in December. We have some amazing enterprises who have used it to power some of their uh, incredible voice experiences, and it's the all-in-one platform for designing a, a VUI, which is a voice user interface, prototyping it, developing it, and actually launching it to both Alexa and Google simultaneously. In fact, this uh, is an Alexa skill built by one of our clients. It was designed, prototyped, and developed entirely on VoiceFlow and featured on the homepage of Amazon last month. This is the new Hugh Jackman, Zach Galifianakis movie, The Missing Link. We've raised $3.5 million in the past 12 months. It's been an incredible ride some, from some awesome capital partners like True Ventures, uh, the founders of Product Hunt, uh, Eventbrite, and Webflow. There's a lot of big, exciting futures. There's now 2.5 billion voice assistants out there, and we're excited to chat about the future. Thanks so much. <clears throat> Cheers. Great job, Braden. <clears throat> OK, this is our final presentation this morning. And for our final speaker, uh, we're going to talk that first impressions really do matter. They matter in business as much as they do in the rest of our lives. And so that goes for the customer experience when you experience a product. We want to have the touch, the look, and the feel of the very packaging that the product arrives in to resonate with us. And to explain this in more detail, I'm going to bring out the CEO of Georgette Packaging. Please welcome the CEO, Sarah Landstreet. Good morning, everyone. I'm Sarah Landstreet, the founder and CEO at Georgette Packaging. The global packaging industry is worth $980 billion, nearly three times the size of the world's entire software industry. Packaging is something that everyone on Earth uses, pays for, and disposes of, almost all on a daily basis. There is no software replacement for packaging. This is an industry that is not going away, and in fact is only growing with consumption. Disruption is drastically needed and inevitable. The same applies to our relationship with disposable packaging and our understanding of the tremendous impact it has on our environment. I believe it is our responsibility as business leaders to drive this change. Uh, there are two primary ways to do so. Number one is by being principled and informed buyers and users of packaging. This is powerful and crucially needed. Number two is by reform from within the packaging industry itself. This is one of our main priorities at Georgette. Now there are two ways, or there are more and less responsible ways to dispose of packaging. More impactfully, there are more and less responsible ways to create packaging. We work with hundreds of consumer brands across North America to develop environmentally preferable packaging. Some of the ways in which we do so are by educating end consumers on the realities of disposal, creating a market for recycled materials, and by carbon offsetting all of our packaging. Georgette Packaging is backed by Y Combinator. We do an annual revenue of $4 million. We're a team of seven, and we're profitable. I believe there is a tremendous shift happening in our industry, that there is much work to be done, and that we are the best team to do it. I invite anyone interested in improving the environmental standard of their packaging to get in touch. Sarah at GeorgettePackaging.com. Thank you. Great job, Sarah. Okay, that's it, everybody. Um, these were 10 
incredible seed stage companies. We're going to do this again tomorrow morning at 9.30. Ten different companies will give you their inspiration and their vision for how they're going to disrupt the world that we live in. We're going to now take a quick five-minute break, and we're going to move right into our opening keynote speaker on this very stage. Thank you very much. It's a unique opportunity to meet here in Hong Kong, where East meets West, Old meets New. This is the place to come to see the best new startups across Asia. This is the hottest emerging area in the world right now. To have a conference of this size that brings talent of this quality from all over the world matters a lot. It reminds me of something out of Star Wars, like a city of the future. We live in a world where innovation is actually on the rise everywhere. For me, there's hope for the future. In this new generation of people, new generation of companies, it is changing the world of technology. It's changing the world. Imagine for a moment that future generations could reach back in time to speak to you. What would they say? Would they despair? Stop. You've no idea what's yet to come. Or would they give hope? Never stop trying for a better tomorrow. Keep imagining, believing, dreaming. Would they tell us of new machines, the secrets of progress? Would they plead with us to care for our world? The very nature of communication will grow in ways you can't possibly imagine, and it will change us forever. These companies have incredible power. You've got to hold the companies to account. Data demands that there be regulation. It's not being seen to do the right thing. It's about actually doing the right thing. This future is arriving so fast that it becomes increasingly difficult to say what shape it will take. The tools that we've created have been turned by others into weapons. Here's the problem. Facebook, it has so much power. It is making a digital clone of our society. We cannot remain silent in this century. We need to do a better job of creating a really safe and inclusive workplace. Build teams of people who believe in something bigger than just what they're working on. This is the biggest opportunity. This is hope. Across the vastness of time, the future calls out to us. And we must answer. WebSum is massive. I mean, the ability to sell our vision to a crowd of 18,000 people, it was very cool. The experience has been amazing. We created great connections with people. You know, we hope that, you know, we're a good alumni to show all the different stages that a young company goes through. And every time we come here, we learn something new, something more, and, and we recalibrate. Pitching on center stage was amazing. You know, the exposure in front of 15,000 people, but also you guys brought some of the best investors here. I am tired of people saying they just can't find good diverse entrepreneurs to fund. You can address a lot of that, I think, by coming to a conference that has invested the time to make sure you've got diverse people here to network with. The winner of the pitch competition was able to capture the imagination of if this work, it's going to be really big. 
think it's a huge opportunity for people who are just starting up their companies to meet the most interesting people. I'd encourage every startup to get involved. It's a unique opportunity to meet here in Hong Kong where East meets West, Old meets New. This is the place to come to see the best new startups across Asia. This is the hottest emerging area in the world right now. To have a conference of this size that brings talent of this quality from all over the world matters a lot. It reminds me of something out of Star Wars, like a city of the future. We live in a world where innovation is actually on the rise everywhere. For me, there's hope for the future. This new generation of people, new generation of companies, it is changing the world of technology. It's changing the world. Imagine for a moment that future generations could reach back in time to speak to you. What would they say? Would they despair? Stop. You've no idea what's yet to come. Or would they give hope? Never stop trying for a better tomorrow. Keep imagining, believing, dreaming. Would they tell us of new machines, the secrets of progress? Would they plead with us to care for our world? The very nature of communication will grow in ways you can't possibly imagine, and it will change us forever. These companies have incredible power. You've got to hold the companies to account. Data demands that there be regulation. It's not being seen to do the right thing, it's about actually doing the right thing. This future is arriving so fast that it becomes increasingly difficult to say what shape it will take. The tools that we've created have been turned by others into weapons. Here's the problem. Facebook, it has so much power. It is making a digital clone of our society. We cannot remain silent in this century. We need to do a better job of creating a really safe and inclusive workplace. Build teams of people who believe in something bigger than just what they're working on. This is the biggest opportunity. This is hope. Across the vastness of time, the future calls out to us. And we must answer. Web Summit's massive. I mean, the ability to sell our vision to a crowd of 18,000 people, it was very cool. The experience has been amazing. We created great connections with people.
you know, we hope that you know, we're a good alumni to show all the different stages that a young company goes through. And every time we come here, we learn something new, something more, and, and we recalibrate. Pitching on center stage was amazing. You know, the exposure in front of 15,000 people, but also you guys brought some of the best investors here. I am tired of people saying they just can't find good diverse entrepreneurs to fund. You can address a lot of that, I think, by coming to a conference that has invested the time to make sure you've got diverse people here to network with. The winner of the pitch competition was able to capture the imagination of if this work it's going to be really big. I think it's a huge opportunity for people who are just starting up their companies to meet the most interesting people. I'd encourage every startup to get involved. It's a unique opportunity to meet here in Hong Kong where East meets West, Old meets New. This is the place to come to see the best new startups across Asia. This is the hottest emerging area in the world right now. To have a conference of this size that brings talent of this quality from all over the world matters a lot. It reminds me of something out of Star Wars, like a city of the future. We live in a world where innovation is actually on the rise everywhere. For me, there's hope for the future. This new generation of people, new generation of companies, it is changing the world of technology. It's changing the world. Imagine for a moment that future generations could reach back in time to speak to you. What would they say? Would they despair? Stop. You've no idea what's yet to come. Or would they give hope? Never stop trying for a better tomorrow. Keep imagining, believing, dreaming. Would they tell us of new machines, the secrets of progress? Would they plead with us to care for our world? The very nature of communication will grow in ways you can't possibly imagine, and it will change us forever. These companies have incredible power. You've got to hold the companies to account. Data demands that there be regulation. It's not being seen to do the right thing. It's about actually doing the right thing. This future is arriving so fast that it becomes increasingly difficult to say what shape it will be. Please welcome to the stage CEO and co-founder of Collision and Web Summit, Paddy Cosgrave. What? Good morning, guys. How is everyone? Good? Ready for a good day? Great. Uh, yesterday evening, we had some fantastic speakers on stage to open, including the Prime Minister uh, of Canada and the fantastic mayor of this city, uh, John Tory. Last night, 
Night Summit. Did anybody go to Night Summit last night? A few. Good, good, good. Means a lot of people had a good long night, probably aren't here uh, just yet. We're incredibly excited to be uh, in Toronto for the very first time. Uh, and I'm really going to get straight to it with our very first speaker on our opening day. Um, we've got quite a treat. So, our very first speaker, um, we're particularly excited to introduce our first speaker of the day. You might know him from incredible movies like Inception, Snowden, and Batman. But when he's not appearing on the silver screen, he's behind the screen at his tech platform, Hit Record. But ahead of that, we'd like to show you a clip showing some of Hit Record's evolution. My brother helped me set up this tiny little website, hitrecord.org. Even at that small scale, there were some people who wanted to make things together. I don't just mean people sharing things online. I mean people making things together that they couldn't have made without each other. We published books, put out records, screened our short films at film festivals, put on live events at big venues. We made a television show. Things that no isolated individual could have made on their own. Let's get back to the fun stuff. Please welcome in conversation with Laurie Siegel, award-winning actor and co-founder of Hit Records, Joseph Gordon-Levitt. Hey guys. And this is Laurie Siegel, everybody, oh, yeah. and fantastic that, I journalist. That's all for me, right? <laughs> <laughs> Familiar with this guy? <laughs> right? Uh, I'm so happy to be here with you. Yeah, it's really good. Thanks for coming right? out, you guys. Really good to see you here. So I know a lot of folks know you as an actor. I've come to know you as an entrepreneur over the last couple of years. And I've also known you've always been obsessed with the internet. Yeah. and this idea of creativity and collaboration. And so I want to jump right into Hit Record, but first, what is it about creativity and collaboration? Like, why this obsession? And if you don't believe he's obsessed with it, like, go to his Twitter feed. I believe the last tweets, you asked people um, how, to, to, how would you ruin a date in one sentence, tweet him. I want to see everyone's tattoos, tweet him take a picture of the ground and post it, literally just like collaborate, tweet, you know, you love people, you love creativity, what is it? Well, I guess probably just to, from a long time ago, I've been really lucky to get a lot out of creativity. I, I consider myself really fortunate that early in life, uh, I figured out, wow, I really love acting. And I happened to grow up in a suburb of Los Angeles where that was more available to me than most people in the world, and I had supportive parents who didn't pressure me into doing it, but uh, were, like I said, supportive in helping me do it. And uh, I've gotten so much joy and fulfillment out of those kinds of creative environments, being on set and acting with people, figuring out a scene, working on stuff, uh, that, uh, that I've always just, um, it's been one of my favorite things to do. It's really kind of, that's where my happiness has always come from, especially in my professional life, leaving aside family. And uh, yeah, so the stuff that you see that you're talking about on Twitter is, is, is really just uh, <laughs> perhaps me feeling guilty that I've gotten so much joy and fulfillment out of this and wanting other people that might not have been uh, as privileged or fortunate as I've been to say like, hey, this is, this is something that we can all do together. And I want to get to hit record, and before we kind of get to it, let's talk about where it came from. And it seems to me, if I recall, like it, you as an actor, hard to believe, but you were kind of getting rejected a lot. Yeah, it's not um, that hard to believe, but thank you. I'm, I'm you know, flattered you'd say that. Yeah, you know, that, that's exactly where it came from. Uh, I was, well, I, I, like I said, I got to be an actor ever since I was a little, little kid, and then I quit when I was 19 because I wanted to go to college. Um, and, uh, and then when I went to get back into acting a couple years later, I couldn't get a job. No one would cast me in anything. And that was really, really painful. Because when you're an actor especially, you're kind of, you need someone to cast you in order to do the acting. And... Uh, they just believed you should be one thing and you believed you should be something different. Yeah, well, yeah, I believed I should be in their movie and they were like, I don't believe you should be in our movie. <laughs> so, 
Uh, <laughs> So this, this, out of this pain came like sort of this realization like, okay, well, I, I can't wait around for someone to cast me in a part. I have to take responsibility for my own creativity. And hit record at that time was just this little turn of phrase, this little like moment of comfort or mantra that I had for myself. Like, you know what? I'm not going to wait for them to cast me. I'm going to push the button. And, and the, the round red record button became this like symbol for me of like, I'm going to hit record. I'm going to push the button and start making my own things. And I started making my own little videos and songs and stories and stuff. And that's all Hit Record was at the time. This is like early, mid 2000s. And, uh, and then my brother helped me set up a little tiny website. At, at first, it was literally a single page of HTML with a few links of little videos and stuff that I had made. And that's all it was. Uh, and we called it hitrecord.org after this little turn of phrase that I had been saying to myself. And um, very slowly, it sort of gradually evolved. Eventually, we, we put a little message board on that website. And for like the techies out there, it was like one of those just PHP message boards, like prefab that anybody could set up. But the message board was where the community started. That was the beginning of people being able to like sign up, create an account on this message board. And what we saw was, okay, well, some people, they want to check out the little videos and songs and stuff that I'm making. But what a lot of people want to do is make things together. And I remember seeing that because it, it wasn't what we had intended it for. But when we noticed that this is what, what people wanted to do, we're like, that's cool. And that's, that's sincerely new and different because just watching a video or listening to a song on the internet, it's not really that different from old technology, television or radio or movies or whatever. But using the internet to collaborate, to have people come together and work on things together that they wouldn't have been able to make on their own, that felt like, oh, this would have been impossible X number of years ago, really recently. This, this is new behavior that humans can now do they couldn't have done before right. because of this technology. And so we thought this is what Hit Record is really about, is this collaboration. And, and it resonated back with m my experience that I've always had because working on a set is a very collaborative thing. And a lot of the joy that comes from a set is being creative with other people. Right. And so from there, it sort of evolved. And, and this community, again, just gradually grew and started to thrive more and more and people were making things together until uh, in 2010, it was almost 10 years ago now, uh, I got together with my friend and co-founder Jared Geller who's backstage somewhere um, and we started saying like, what if this community, this sort of collaborative creative process could power a production company? And uh, we figured out how to make that happen. We figured out how to set up the intellectual property laws, the terms of service how um, people could remix each other, build off of what each other was doing, how if um, productions were monetized, how we could pay people. Um, and we made a list of things we'd like to accomplish. Like maybe one day we could use this sort of collaborative methodology to make a short film that could get into Sundance. Or one day we could publish a book or put out a record. And maybe one day we could like even make a TV show or something like that. And then over the years we, we did all those things. And uh, our TV show won an Emmy and we've worked with different brands, big, brands like LG and Sony and Samsung and nonprofits like the ACLU and um, we've paid people almost three million bucks now and uh, we have published books and we've put out records and I'm really, really proud of everything that we've gotten to do as a production company. And then just in the last couple years, we sort of said like, okay, so we did, we did all that, but we're hitting a certain limit of how many people can really be involved right. in this collaborative process. Because when we're the ones leading these productions, only so many people can come and get involved in those productions. And that's when we realized, like, okay, if we wanted to, uh, if we wanted to open that up and let anybody come lead a project yeah. and really let a, an infinite number of people get involved in this collaborative process, we need better technology. And that's when we sort of waded into the world of technology, which is when I met you. Right. And I, wanna, to, and I, and I want to get to that because I think a lot of things happen and, and so everyone kind of understands how this works. So essentially, people come, they have an idea, artists are able to, to come to the platform and everybody gets involved and these things get funded and everyone kind of comes together to create something. You guys have had this real success. And when I met you, uh, it, was at, uh, it was at Collision or Web Summit a couple of years ago and a lot of things were happening. We were having this conversation about the internet 
and isolation and things were getting kind of weird on the internet and social media. <laughs> in 2016? And, yeah, 2016. And I, I interviewed... I interviewed you, and the next day, Donald Trump was uh, elected president of the United States, and we were talking a lot about tech and isolation and social networks, and, and also, you know, this idea of creativity and how creativity was getting harder because of the way social networks were set up. Um, and, and you were talking about how it was making the creative process a little bit more difficult. Can, uh, explain that a little bit. Yeah, sure. So... And you can even explain it in the, the term of how you, you talked to me a little bit, compared it to the movies and, and, how you, and how you shoot movies. Yeah. Well, so I, I think that, to your point, creativity can be difficult when your incentives are all about how much attention can I get for this? Or in terms of movies, what's the box office going to be? Or is this movie going to make me famous? What's it going to be like to walk the red carpet? When these are the kinds of things that you have on your mind, I think it's it can twist what I've found to be that, that joyful, meaningful thing that I was talking about a minute ago. And where you really hit that joy, that kind of flow state, is, is not when you're focused on, on the red carpets and the attention and the box office, but when you're focused on the actual creative process itself of being on set and making stuff together with other people. And, and I do think that a lot of social media platforms today um, they really emphasize the attention getting. Those are the incentives that you have. Uh, that's what the user experience provides you is what can you get? What are your goals? You can get followers, you can get likes. There, there isn't really a way for the business model of those media tech platforms to measure and monetize a meaningful creative experience. It's more about how much attention can I get? And, uh, and I think that when you set out to make a thing, whether it's a song or a short film or a story or whatever, and your ultimate path is going to be posting it on one of these platforms, then you go through in your mind and you start thinking while you're in the middle of writing or singing or whatever, is this going to get a lot of likes? How many followers is this going to get me? And I think that's, that's not really good for the creative process. Did and you so, find yourself comparing yourself to other actors and their millions of followers? Of course. I'm yeah. definitely not Which actors? immune to this. Which ones? <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, I'm not going to say which okay. ones. <laughs> the probably obvious ones. I don't know. Yeah. Anyone. Anyone that I... Like, they, we're human. I think it's natural to compare right. ourselves to each other. Um, but I think that's, that's sort of a human weakness that, a lot, that these platforms exploit to their advantage. And with Hit Record, what we're trying to build now is uh, a different kind of collaborative media platform that puts the emphasis less on how much attention can I get for this? And more, how meaningful can this creative experience be with these other people? Less about, hey, look at me and look what I've made, and more about yeah. what can we all make together? So let's talk about what you're doing. So in, that, in the time that we, I spoke to you then, you actually went out to Silicon Valley um, and you raised money to move Hit Record beyond a production company and really turn it into a technology company. So what does that mean? Explain the shift. You know, Talk to me a little bit about who you raised money from. Sure, yeah, so we never had to raise money before. Uh, we made money as a production company when we would partner with brands or when we would make a TV show or something. Uh, we wouldn't make money, we would pay our contributors and the company was able to pay its bills and grow a bit. Um, but like I said, we were running into these limits of how many people can we really include when we don't have enough of a technology and product team to really build tools that allow people to effectively lead their own projects. And so, yeah, we went up to Silicon Valley saying like, hey, we've done all this as a production company, we've amassed this community that's really special, that has a uniquely positive and encouraging and safe sort of uh, feeling to it. And we think that this can be something that grows um, beyond a production company if we focus it uh, in terms of it being a platform for anybody to come and lead their own projects. But we need to be able to build the better tools. And that's why I didn't, we didn't want to raise money in Hollywood, which might have been easier because I, you know, I know lots of people in Hollywood. We wanted to go into Silicon Valley and, uh, and we pitched technology VCs with this idea and we were able to raise a great Series A and we raised six and a half million dollars and we were able to hire, we went from literally zero product people to now, you know, then we had one and now we have five. We had, you know, four engineers and then we had five and now we have 10. And now we're really finally able to start building things 
uh, that are that are going to allow more and more people to come and 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 lead their own projects and find the collaborators and have that creative experience that find that meaningful joyful experience that I've been lucky enough to to uh, enjoy my whole life um, of of being creative with other people. I mean, it, you could have gone to Hollywood. You could have taken the easy you know the easy path, but you went to Silicon Valley. You know, and you very much kind of had to explain yourself as a, in this new type of context. And I know you're Joseph Gordon-Levitt, right? And I know that probably opened some doors. What was the most challenging part of having to, you know, not play entrepreneur, but actually go in? And, and I'm assuming the timing was on your side because there is this narrative around technology about we need to find a better way to, to come together, collaborate, make it a little bit, you know, less evil in, in some capacity, um, you know, but what was the most challenging part? You know, talk to us about what you learned about yourself as an entrepreneur. Yeah, I mean, I think you're right that um, being an actor and being in some successful movies was helpful and opened doors. There was also, though, a, a, another edge to that sword in that people, a lot of investors assumed, oh, you're an actor, sure, yeah, you're starting a company, you're not really going to be involved in it, and great. Um, but I think once I started talking to folks and saying like, hey, this isn't just a new idea that we just came up with. This is actually something we've been doing for almost 10 years now. We've amassed this community, never having spent any money on ads. We've worked with all these brands. We've you know, won an Emmy for our TV show. Um, I've been heavily involved in this. We're really, really doing this. Um, people started to say like, oh, wow, you really are doing this. Okay, cool. And uh, and yeah, we were able to find some great partners that have been so valuable. Javelin, Crosslink, Advance It. You know, these are, these are folks that are not just uh, investing money. These are folks that I'm on the phone with a lot because I, you know, admit I haven't seen or been a part of software development, pro level software development. And uh, I don't want to, you know, have the hubris to say like, well, can't be that hard. I'll just... You know, I'll just do that. Uh, I want to surround myself with people who have that experience and, and uh, the smarts to really provide guidance. And so let's talk the business model, right? So now you're a venture-backed company that comes along with all sorts of new responsibilities um, and the pressure to make money. And uh, when it comes to internet companies and the business model, we've run into all sorts of problems in this new era when it comes to that. And What's good for business, as we've learned from social media, is oftentimes not good for human beings. Yeah. How do you avoid falling into the same trap that you're kind of fighting against when it comes to that attention economy? Yeah, um, that's a great question. So the, the problem that I was trying to articulate a second ago about how I think a lot of today's social media platforms can kind of corrupt a creative process, I don't think that the technology itself is a problem. I think actually that it, it's the business model to your question about business model. And this isn't an original thought for me, but I really recommend this book. It's called uh, 10 Arguments for Deleting Your Social Media Accounts Right Now by Jaron Lanier. Uh, it's a blunt title, but it's actually really sophisticated thinking. And his thesis is just that, that the business model of giving away a product or service for free while sort of opaquely collecting data about people and using that data to manipulate them uh, towards the will of advertisers who pay lots of money for the ability to manipulate all those users. That's not a sound business model that'll be good for humanity in the long run. That's, that's Jaron's whole thesis. And um, I, I think he's an incredibly smart thinker about this stuff. I recommend you read his book. He's become a friend of mine. And, um, and, and so to your point about business model, uh, I was very clear from the beginning in all of these pitch meetings how I feel about that business model and that if we're going to evolve from a production company into a platform, uh, that we're not going to monetize hit record this way. Um, we've, we've never really uh, focused on sheer volume of eyeballs. We've always really focused on having our community and a, a real sincere depth of affinity um, from that community. And I think there's, there's plenty of ways that you can monetize uh, a platform like that that aren't working against the wills or sort of opaquely manipulating the wills of the community, but rather helping the community actually do what it wants to do, which is be creative together with other people. Um, and so uh, that's, those are the business models that, that we're you know, designing right now. 
I want to talk a little bit about this idea of creativity. Um, you said something to me. We had a pre-call, and you said something I related to quite a bit regarding creativity. And you, you were talking about moments of pain or anxiety. Um, I wish we had a couch so we could lay down. You could lay down while I ask you this question. Um, moments of pain or anxiety or discontent that you know you're compelled to write or make something. You've been a creator your whole life. You, you know this whole company is you trying to give back to other people and have them create. And I relate in that covering entrepreneurs for you know for 10 years. When you look at and when you look at art, the same theme kind of emerges, and it seems that it's these moments of extraordinary discomfort and pain and like the worst stuff, like in mental gymnastics, I'm sorry if any of you guys were there, um, that lead to some of these incredible, creative, uh, interesting moments. And I'd be curious to know for you if there are any moments that you could think of, of you know, incredible discomfort or pain and, and what creative what creativity that's led to. Sure. Well, I mean, the, the first example is the pain I was talking about when I, I couldn't get a role, and Hit Record was born out of that. Uh, I think there are big moments and small moments uh, like that. That's a really interesting question. Um, I mean, in my life, the, the best way for me to just quell any anxiety, whether it's big anxiety or small anxiety, is to sit down and, and just kind of focus and do something creative. Um, you know, and that could be like, you know what, I'm just gonna sit here and write meaningless rhymes. Just to like focus my mind and like stop the, the whirlpool of, of, you know, the way that the human brain can go. Um, or like, I don't know, the most painful thing in my life, and we're talking about Hit Record, uh, my brother who, who I started Hit Record with died in 2010, and it's the most terrible thing ever for me. Uh, he was my best friend and, and uh, it was extremely painful, and um, there's no way to get around that kind of pain. Um, but one of the ways that I found uh, able to myself able to kind of deal with it would be like writing, and I would like I would write him letters, and uh, I'd write it even though he wasn't going to read them. Um, but just the the process of uh, of sitting down and writing and, and making it a well-written letter, you know, uh, something that he might enjoy really reading. Um, and not to show to anybody, but just the process of expressing those thoughts and feelings, um, I would, 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 would lift me out of uh, the kind of painful grief that any of you who've ever lost a, a close loved one knows um, that you can be feeling. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I absolutely, for myself, from my own experience, believe in the power of that, that whether you like to write or you like to draw or you like to sing or you like to, whatever it is that you like to do, um, don't, doesn't have to be some kind of professional thing. It doesn't have to be something that, you know, the judges on Idol would give you good marks for. It doesn't have to be, doesn't, it doesn't matter what it would look like or sound like to anybody else. It's about what it, feels like uh, for me while I'm doing it, or for you while you're doing it. That creative process, uh, I think is, well, like I said at the beginning, it's, it's just been the, the, the biggest source of joy and meaning for me in my life. And, um, and I, yeah, that's, I guess if there's the one thing that I am trying to kind of put the emphasis back on is, is that, that process and that feeling and that experience of doing it from your own point of view, not from other people's point of view, not, not caring about what it might look like to someone else, but just to, to appreciate the, the power of that experience that you yourself can have for yourself. It almost feels like you're talking about taking um, your narrative back or kind of like the power of having your own narrative or being who you are, which... In all fairness, um, with social media and with uh, the internet and everything that it promised to be, it feels, I think a lot of us feel a little bit more lost when you, when you have this at your fingertips all the time. I think that is harder than it used to be. Yeah. Well, yeah, you're, you can start telling your story for the benefit of who? For the benefit of, ultimately for the benefit of these platforms that are like monetizing the attention that you can get from whoever pays attention to you while you post. Um, but, and, and, I also don't want to um, 
leads you to believe that what I'm talking about is, is isolation. You don't have to do this in isolation. You can focus on that kind of creative process with other people. That's actually where I have done it the most. Like I said, being on a set is a very collaborative thing. Um, and, and yeah, so again, this is, this is ultimately what we're, trying to, what we're trying to build with Hit Record is an environment, an ecosystem that puts that emphasis on the experience of being creative and, um, and how that creative experience can often be unlocked when you reach out to other people and say like, hey, let's, let's make something together. Um, and I also think it takes a real, um, I was joking last <laughs> backstage, I, I unfortunately for you watched Brene Brown on Netflix. Have you guys watched the special on Netflix? Okay, wrong crowd for that, it. I'm sorry. Um, but she was talking about how it takes like real vulnerability to have like courage. Um, and I think putting yourself out there to be creative is really courageous. Um, and I think if I were to look, because I've interviewed you now a couple times throughout the years, and if I were to look at patterns in your life, you were uh, an actor who walked away from acting when you were a, a star at a young age, and you kind of took a break. You said, and then you came back and you said, no, I'm not that, I'm this. And, and people didn't pay attention, and you, you know, started hit record anyway. Um, and then also, you know, you could have done the easy thing and raised money in Hollywood where everyone took your calls and you went to Silicon Valley where I've been in Silicon Valley for a long time. Even though I know you're Joseph Gordon-Levitt, I'm sure you were met with a lot of skepticism and you had to play hardball in those ways. Um, and I think that takes a lot of vulnerability to, to kind of put yourself and continue to put yourself in, in you know, in the, the, put yourself out there like that. I wonder, where do you think that comes from? Where does it come from? Wow. I don't know. I, I, where my mind goes is just uh, as a parent myself, I think my parents did a really good job of making me feel safe and able to take those risks. Um, I don't know. So maybe there. Great. And then when you look now, hit record, um, and you look to the future, you, we've now seen it all the way through like 2004 when it, we were talking about it, just like a couple lines of code. Um, where do you see this thing going in the context of the internet and where we're going with kind of trends and, and whatnot? Where, now that you have this funding and whatnot, what does this look like down the road? I would just like it to be a place where anybody out there, not just people who want to start a career in show business, but just anybody, anybody out there who has that urge to be creative can find a, a safe and encouraging place not to become a star necessarily, Although, I guess that can happen, but, but not for that. But to have that experience that I've been talking about up here and to, to really be creative with other people and, and have the satisfying journey of being like, okay, let's make something. How do we start? Then what do we have to do? And how can we finish it together? And then we can celebrate it. And um, that's just been such a satisfying thing for me. Uh, I want more and more people to be able to experience that. I don't think that a lot of the big media tech platforms are really providing that exact thing to people. Um, and uh, so I, I think there, there's a need there to, to kind of reorient what creativity can really be about and uh, provide a place for that to flourish. Great. Joseph Cornette, thank you so much. Thank Appreciate you. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Which way do we go? This I way? Guess So two years ago, Waymo put self-driving cars on the road for the first time in Phoenix, Arizona. And since that time, Waymo's autonomous vehicles have driven an incredible 10 million miles on public roads in the United States. 
So, does this major milestone bring us further along the road toward making autonomous vehicles a reality at scale? To hear more and to tell us all about it, please welcome the Chief Technology Officer for Waymo, Dmitry Dolgov. Good morning, and thank you for having me here today. I'm particularly excited to be in Toronto because the city has been the backdrop to some incredible developments in artificial intelligence, specifically deep learning. At Waymo, deep learning touches every part of our system, from how our cars perceive the world, to how they predict the actions of others around us, to how they make safe and comfortable driving decisions. So what this means is that the history of Waymo and the progress we've made on self-driving cars is very much intertwined with the discoveries that were being made just a few miles away. And while the dream of cars that drive themselves has been around for many decades as science fiction, the reality of self-driving cars, much like the advances that have been made in deep learning, is relatively new. It was just 10 years ago, in January 2009, when a group of a dozen people came together and the self-driving car project got started at Google. I was fortunate to be one of those people, and I have to say those early days were pretty amazing. What many of us had in common, of, um, I guess you'd call them incidents, uh, which may be apt for the name of this conference, a few problems with uh, perception or routing here and there. The house was not where the car is supposed to be. And to be clear, that was not my car. My team, Stanford, stayed out of trouble and placed second. Now, the competition was a once-in-a-lifetime experience. We were super excited by the early results. And we knew the technology showed a lot of promise. But we also knew it would take a lot of time, resources, and breakthroughs to turn it into a real product people could use. And back then, there was no self-driving car industry to speak of. Fortunately, Google realized how transformative this technology could be, and our project was born. What motivated us then, and still drives me today, is the belief that self-driving cars can make our roads safer. Each year, more than 1.3 million people die on the roadways around the world. That's almost 150 deaths every hour of every day. More than two people every minute. And we know that 94% of crashes involve human error. People get drunk. They get tired, they get distracted. Self-driving cars don't. At Waymo, we like to say our goal is not to build a car. We're building the driver. Our mission is to make it safe and easy for people and things to move around. And we'll do that by being the world's most experienced driver. What's more, this technology has the potential to make transportation more accessible for everyone. In the first phase of our project, in 2009, our goal was to build on these early results and learn what it would take to drive on actual public roads. So we've set ourselves two major milestones. One was to drive a total of 100,000 miles in autonomous mode, which was orders of magnitude more than that 60-mile route our cars drove during the DARPA challenge. The other milestone was to drive these 10 100-mile routes in full autonomy, beginning to end with zero human intervention. You're seeing footage of some of these trips on the screen right now. To learn as much as we could about the problem as quickly as we could, we carefully selected these 10 routes to be very challenging and cover the full spectrum of driving conditions. And even with such a small team and the technology of 2009, we were able to make progress quickly and reach these milestones in under two years. In our second phase, we wanted to bring this technology to life. In 2015, 
were able to complete the world's first fully self-driving ride. We did it in Austin, Texas, in a custom-designed vehicle that we called the Firefly. It had no steering wheel or pedals. The person you see here is our friend, Steve Mann. And what made all of this even more remarkable is that he happens to be blind. There were no police escorts, no chase vehicle, no test drivers on board, just Steve taking a ride from a doctor's office to a park. This was a historic moment. But there's an incredible amount of work involved in taking technology from a stage where something could be done once to a point where it can be repeated every day. So that's what we set out to do. And building on that single trip, we've since expanded to ongoing testing on a fleet of driverless cars. Which brings us to our third phase, taking this technology and turning it into a product. Last December, we launched our commercial service, Waymo One. And today, over 1,000 people in Metro Phoenix are using our vehicles to get around. They take them to school, to work, to run errands. We've also begun giving some members of the public a chance to experience their first truly driverless rides with no one in the driver's seat. Take a look. Getting our technology to a point where we can serve people has been incredibly valuable because now we can learn from real users. Over the last 100 years, cars have gotten faster and smarter, but the way people use them hasn't fundamentally changed. And in a world where everyone is a passenger, we've had to reimagine user experience. We've built an app to hail the vehicle, developed in-car controls and screens, and created a rider support system for when people have questions. Our user interface is designed to communi communicate just the right amount of information at the right time. To do this, we take real-time data from our sensors and software and abstract that information into what you see here. We want to anticipate when our users have questions and be proactive about letting them know what the vehicle is doing. For example, in this case, a passenger may wonder why the car has slowed down at the intersection. At a glance, they can see that we're yielding to a pedestrian. Another area where we're learning a lot from our customers is pickups and drop-offs. And having a precise understanding of where people want to go is fundamental to getting somebody from point A to point B. And users of regular ride-hailing services tell us that one of the most frustrating experiences is getting picked up or dropped off at the wrong spot. That's why user feedback from our service has been really important. Take a recent example in Phoenix where we dropped off a rider at a spot right across the road from their destination. As a pin drop on a map, the location our vehicle chose made a lot of sense. But there's one detail we didn't account for, a wall of cacti. Now, obstruction by cacti uh, might be an only an Arizona kind of issue, but our users expect us to get it right, whether it's an office park or a shopping mall. And through rider feedback, we're teaching our cars to get smarter at what makes a good pickup spot. We're leveraging walking directions from Google, Google Maps, to make better decisions and suggestions. For example, we have a good understanding of stores and store entrances. So if a user is hailing a Waymo inside a mall, we'll suggest a pickup spot at a nearby exit. We also take into account what we think is more convenient for users. For example, people are okay to cross a suburban street, but not so happy to cross a major road. So we anticipate that in choosing pickup and drop-off locations. So that's right hailing. We think it's a great way to have a lot of people try out our technology. But ultimately, we believe that self-driving vehicles can reshape transportation more broadly. That's because we're building a driver. And by building that safe and capable driver, we're able to deploy that driver across different commercial applications. Put another way, while ride-hailing, trucking, and deliveries are different products, 
the fundamental challenges of building a good driver are the same. That means the tools and core ingredients we've brought together apply to all of these products. So right hailing is just the beginning. I see a Waymo to move goods with trucking and local deliveries, a Waymo to help connect people to public transportation, and a Waymo to shuttle us around in our own vehicles. Now, one of the reasons we're able to build that safe and capable driver is because we designed the entire self-driving system, both hardware and software, in-house. Our tightly integrated system means we can get the most from our self-driving sensors and compute and use the power of AI and deep learning to build more capable software. Together, we're able to create a virtuous development cycle where better hardware leads to better software. And, ins and the insights from better software help make our hardware even better. Let's start with hardware. A fully self-driving car needs the right sensors to handle the roads, whether it's day or night or inclement weather. And to get a rich picture of what's around us, we use lighters, cameras, and radars. Even though these technologies have existed many years before self-driving cars, our sensors had to be reimagined to handle the unique task of self-driving and built to work seamlessly together. Our lighters work by creating millions of laser points every second to give our vehicle a 3D view of the world. Lighters are one of our most important sensors because they directly measure distance with high resolution and can operate in complete darkness. We designed a complete system of LiDAR sensors that can see 360 degrees around the vehicle from up close all the way to three football fields away. This lets us see objects immediately around the car, like a cat dashing out in front, as well as things at long range, like construction cones on a highway. Our vision system is made up of 19 cameras and provides high-resolution color imagery all 360 degrees around the vehicle. And because our vehicles operate at all times of day and night, our cameras have high dynamic range that allows them to see in a wide variety of lighting conditions, from an unlit parking lot in the middle of the night to the blazing sun at sunset. Now, you may be wondering what's happening in this video. While our cameras may be high-tech, we use a pretty low-tech solution to make sure birds don't block our view. And that's what's being tested here, our cleaning simulated bird poop. Also on board, we have an array of radars. Our system has a 360-degree integrated field of view, letting us track objects all around our car. Unlike radar systems found in many cars today, which were designed for highway driving, our radar system is designed to handle urban conditions as well. Finally, with all of these powerful sensors, you need a powerful computer to process this large and diverse set of data in order to make real-time driving decisions with low latency. In every Waymo vehicle is a custom-designed computer. In fact, each vehicle actually has two computers. The secondary one acts as a backup for safety. Every design decision we've made has been the result of what we've learned over the last decade and through more than 10 million miles of self-driving. We know that when it comes to sensing for self-driving cars, it's not about any single sensor. With their unique strengths, each has a role to play in creating a capable and safe system. For example, lighters can see in 3D and in the dark, cameras can see much more detail and add color to the scene, and radar can see through rain, snow, and fog. So here, the whole really is more powerful than the sum of its parts. So that's a bit about hardware. Now, on the software side, AI has been a game changer. And today, it touches every part of our system. As the revolution of deep learning and convolutional nets was getting underway around 2012, we knew that this would be a step change in performance and capability for our technology. So we began to apply deep learning to our own system. And the field has only continued to make exciting new advances. To stay at the cutting edge, we found that you need a few key ingredients. First, it's important to have high-quality data that's targeted for learning. At Waymo, we're able to collect rich and high-resolution data from all of our sensors. And this opens up some pretty exciting opportunities. The last decade 
has demonstrated the power of ML to learn from two-dimensional images. Now, our researchers and others in the field are working to apply deep learning to a 3D world by fusing images from cameras with LiDAR point clouds and radar returns. Second, you need to train your ML models on that data. That means you need infrastructure and frameworks to store and process data efficiently at scale. For this, we use the TensorFlow ecosystem and rely on Google's powerful data center. And third, you need to invest in discovering new high-quality ML models. We have active research in a number of promising areas, from supervised ML to imitation and reinforcement learning. And what's more, we also have the benefit of expertise and collaborations with Google. And with these ingredients of modern AI, we can tackle some of the most difficult driving challenges in the key areas of perception, prediction, and planning. Because it's not just about detecting objects and not bumping into them. At its core, driving is a social task. So we need machine learning to give our system a deep semantic understanding of the world. For perception, this means giving our system the capability to understand context. We call this scene level understanding. Take a look at this. Four stop signs. Sure, we can detect each one, but what does each one actually mean, and how should it affect our behavior? In the top left corner, we understand that it controls the four-way intersection and requires our vehicle to stop before proceeding. In the second below, we also have to recognize that the stop sign is on a school bus and behave accordingly. On the top right, the crossing guard has her sign up, but she's leaving the intersection. And the last one is a particularly rare situation where the right thing to do is to actually ignore the stop sign altogether. For prediction, at a basic level, we can do that by understanding the rules of the road and the speed and direction of different users. But that's not enough. We also need to understand how different objects on the road interact with one another. In this example, we're able to understand how a parked car up ahead may affect the behavior of others. From that, we're able to anticipate well in advance that the cyclists will, work, will want to merge into our lane. And deep nets are letting us interpret more nuance on the road than ever before. We can use contextual information, like the relative position of one road user to another, as well as many other signals, such as subtle changes in speed, to make more accurate predictions of what others will do next. Now planning. In highly interactive driving situations like merges, prediction and planning go hand in hand. And what makes the previous example a good illustration is that slowing down was not our vehicle's only option. As we approach the parked car, there are actually a number of potential moves our car could have made. It could have sped up to pass ahead of the cyclists, slowed down to let them in, or changed lanes to avoid them altogether. Now, in this situation, changing lanes might have been a good action but there's actually a fast-moving car approaching from behind. And at that distance and relative speeds, that driver would probably not be too happy to being cut off. And the right driving decision depends on the specifics of each situation. And getting it right requires a deep understanding of the social conventions of driving and the expectations of others in the scene, which, of course, can change at any moment. And since this, uh, these social interactions are not bound by simple rules, deep learning is showing a lot of promise in this area as well. It allows us to observe and capture the fine nuances of what constitutes good driving behavior, helping us build a safe, smooth, and predictable driver. Whether it's being polite and considerate to two dogs on a midnight run, avoiding a runner darting in front of a vehicle chasing her dog, maintaining calm, in the hectic traffic of San Francisco, or being the crossing guard and policeman in a school zone. With our 10 million miles of real-world experience and billions of miles of simulated driving, as well as powerful AI algorithms, we're building a driver to handle all types of rare and complex situations. As you can see, it's an incredibly complex problem and it requires the right tools and technical ingredients informed by testing and insights from our real users. And with the start of our ride-hailing service, we're pooling all of these pieces together for the first time. What we're building now 
has been developed with scale in mind. We're laying foundations and moving purposefully with the goal to bring our technology to more people in more cities around the world. Thank you. Imagine for a moment that future generations could reach back in time to speak to you. What would they say? Would they despair? Stop. You've no idea what's yet to come. Or would they give hope? Never stop trying for a better tomorrow. Keep imagining, believing, dreaming. Would they tell us of new machines, the secrets of progress? from Y Combinator, which is one of the world's most influential seed accelerators. Some of you in this room will know that I work for Techstars, so I may ask the panel to also talk about companies like SendGrid, Twilio, uh, DigitalOcean, and ClassPass. But let's go straight to the source. I want to introduce CNBC's Deirdre Bosa, along with the CEO of Y Combinator, Michael Siebel, and partner, Adora Chung. Okay. Oh. All right. All right. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Adora. How are you? Good morning. How are you? And I have the pleasure of welcoming you, welcoming you to Toronto. We all got in from San Francisco, but Toronto is my hometown, born and bred. So I'm happy to be here, and I'm happy to welcome you guys here. Thank you for having us. And I hope you can catch the Raptors game tonight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So the introduction, if you, as if you guys need one, um, Y Combinator has been behind some of the biggest startups of the last decade. And I'm really happy that we get to walk on stage at this moment because I believe a blog post just went public. And this is, really gets to the core of what Y Combinator does. And it's called a request for startups. So it used to be every year. Now it's every quarter. Y Combinator puts out a request for startups on a certain theme in the past that has been journalism, it has been things for Twitter. The last one was... What carbon was it? capture. Carbon capture. Yeah. And so we're happy to announce this time it is Government 2.0. So why this right now? And explain a little bit about where the idea even came from. So one of the trends we're seeing with YC startups nowadays is they actually are so fed up with government they're very interested in making their communities or their countries a better place. And we started seeing this with a number of companies in a number of different areas. So Lambda School with Education um, and Make School with Education, kind of taking over job training, taking over college. Um, M Relief in distributing food aid to people who are hungry. Promise helping with mass incarceration, so on and so forth. So we saw this trend amongst YC founders and we thought of it as very against what people think of what the Valley is doing. So we wanted to create this RFS to basically communicate to all the founders in the world who actually want to make like, the world a better place, we want to fund your companies. And so and that's what we're doing. Adora, why do you think that there is this frustration? Is that unique to America? Is what have been sort of the conditions to enable this request for startups and a government 2.0? What's wrong essentially with government yeah. 1.0? Well, I think we traditionally look to the government as a platform that provides equal opportunity to contribute and benefit from the great economic growth of, of the country. Um, and we're seeing less and less of that. Um, and so, so I think when you think about that, it, it's, it includes a basic social, a good social safety net. So 
if you start with like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the bottom two tiers, food, access to food, water, shelter, safety, and security, as well as affordable housing, like Michael said, affordable health care, good high quality education, healthy living environment, and so on and so forth. Um, and so we've seen a reduction in the government spending on these things. Um, and honestly, it's, it's, it's quite not surprising that you know, they're not good at doing all these things at once because it's quite a monumental task to do a lot of, a lot of things good at once. Um, and so we think to make America better that there's this opportunity where we can get startups. There are many great companies to be built to solve these slices of governments of failure. Right. Or failure and, of government, yeah. You know, what you're describing and, you know, what Michael, you said was sort of a frustrating place to be. Why would startups want to touch the space when it can be so politically explosive and when it can be so difficult and there's so many obstacles, particularly in America, to do things like this? And is that the reason why we haven't seen more, why you're, you're making this request? I think startup founders are a little crazy and a little stupid. And I think that that's the kind of energy you need to tackle some of the hardest problems in the world. Because it's just very easy to look at uh, America and say, oh, it's too hard. Like, Congress can't do it, the president can't do it. It's gotta be too hard. And um, I don't know, when you look at a YC batch, it's a bunch of people who are actually trying to do something that looks impossible, and they're really motivated. So, um, why are they so motivated? I mean, I think once conditions get to a certain point in your country, you start not thinking about just getting rich for yourself or your family. You start thinking about like how you can improve the lives of your community. Is it not a scary place, though, when you have this tech backlash and regulations being decided against you know, America's biggest tech companies like Facebook and Google and Amazon? Um, do you think that founders and startups are worried about this? And is that, does that fit into why you decided on Government 2.0 this year, Adora? Um, I, I don't think, certainly there, I think that's a macro condition of the tech backlash and hopefully that changes over time. I think founders tend to be, like Michael said, they're a little bit crazy and they tend to be very optimistic about the future and certainly tech is going to be a part of that and so we don't see it as contradictory to what we're trying, we're hoping founders will do. Right. Now I want to go back to your very first request for startups. Um, <laughs> The future of journalism. I was particularly interested in this one. And your call to arms said, we think newspapers and magazines will mostly die. Mm -hmm. So in no uncertain terms, you say we need new forms of digital media. How do you think we've done? I think hmm. we're st I mean, for a long time, people were thinking about page views. And then they thought about monetization. Whereas I think the call for a request for startup for that one was reverse, which is let's think about how do we get paid first, and then how do we create great journalism. And so you've seen a lot of examples of this, I think, already. We funded a startup called Substack, and so that's basically writers, former journalists, uh, reporters, and just writers in general who um, get paid on a monthly basis um, by those subscribers to write great content. Mm -hmm. um, and there's no edict for them, they're just, you know, writing what they want, and they're making a lot more money than they would, you know, writing for a newspaper today. Um, so I think we're seeing, I guess it's been nine or ten years since that came out, mm -hmm. but we're starting to see, I think, a little bit of that now. And at the same time, how much has changed since then? And it's actually the newspapers and the magazines, some of the older, from the previous time, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, that are still the most trusted. Mm -hmm. Um, or untrusted, <laughs> depending on which side you're looking at it. And there's been this proliferation of fake news. So um, what are, and, and also we talk about digital media and their declining valuation. So Michael, where do you think we are? And is there still work to do here? If you were looking at this request for startups 10 years ago, this is where we are. Have you guys, have startups and Silicon Valley done their jobs? I would say, What's interesting about that RFS now that we didn't predict back then was how much the large social platforms really are going to influence proliferation of news. So I think that the challenge here is now who's responsible for policing fake news. Right. I think fake news isn't something that we could really fully understand 10 years ago. And now I look squarely at Facebook. I mean, to be completely honest, like if fake news is being used to influence elections or create violence, um, you can really no longer claim that you have just like user-generated content protection. Um, just morally, you should be far more interested in making sure your 
platform is distributing real information. Yeah, we actually have an RFS for this specifically in combating fake videos because if you, you probably know, but if you Google around for uh, videos, it's very scary mm -hmm. what AI can do today. Um, and so we think it's similar to government 2.0. It's very key that we fix this. So it's interesting. We've kind of come full circuit here. We talked about government 2.0 and maybe some of the hesitations of tech companies to get into this space. But at the same time, how do you now regulate? Do you leave that up to the government? Or do you do a request for startups and have the technology industry regulate itself? I think that government moves at an appropriate pace. Like I think that government always needs to lag innovation with regulation or else they're gonna over-regulate and, 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 and destroy. And I think that you've seen kind of cities get wise to a lot of the regulations that maybe should have had in place before. I'm, I think government probably has a role to play in regulation, but I actually think it's more interesting to talk about the moral obligation of the CEOs running these com companies. Because I think at the end of the day, you know, you can compete over revenue, but at some point you have to look around at the country you're in and the world you're in and ask yourself like, Am I going to build the legacy by building the largest company by re revenue, or am I build the legacy by solving the most important problems that exist in the world? Yeah, that's a really great point that you brought up, the moral obligation of founders and startups. But the way that startups and founders operate now, and you see a lot of these companies now coming to public markets with majority power, majority control of the companies. How important is that to you when you're investing in the seed round? And do you need to know what a founder wants to do with regards to regulation and discipline and controls within the company? Well, I mean, I think what's interesting about this RFS is that like for these companies, I think the kind of financial gain and the moral responsibility are completely aligned. You know, these are companies that have an impact goal in addition to wanting to be sustainable and self-funding and, and for-profit. And I think that more and more, that's gonna be the model for companies. And they're either going to come in and start that way or they're gonna morph into that. Because I think at some point, you know, if you're Amazon, if you're Facebook, you've gotta ask yourself, like, what else are we, like, what's the next goal, right? Like, what else are we trying to do here? And I think that, like, you know, one of the things I've been waiting for these platforms to do is pick some social project and nail it, like voter registration. Any of the top five platforms could just make America effectively 100% voter registered within a year. And, like, if any of them chose to do something like that, they'd all have to compete over some other impact goal and then actually start moving the ball on those goals. I feel like that's an optimistic way of looking at it. But, and, and maybe you have to be, but <laughs> the journalist, so I'll be the skeptic. Um, and Adora, you, you brought up the example of Facebook, and there's still a lot of people unhappy with the steps that Facebook has not taken. So when you get to that size, nearing a trillion dollars in market cap, and the founder still is slow or you know, not fulfilling what he promised years ago, how can you trust? And you have, I'll give you another example is Uber, right? They had a year of crisis after crisis. They had to get rid of the CEO, and that may not be as straightforward in other cases. Um, hmm. I think there are a couple ways to look at this. One is we don't have all the information that the CEO has. And so the way it might look like the way a CEO is making a decision is antithetical to what we would do. Um, so I guess I would have a little empathy for the CEO in, that in, in, in most scenarios, but overall, I mean, when we invest in the startup, we, I mean, we personally have a code of ethics, and if you violate any one of those things, you're out. Um, and we just hope that, you know, as you're growing fast, as you're hiring people, that you just follow it, and, um, uh, and you put good people around you. And so we try to help the founders put good people around them um, as they scale. Is that a big part of when a company comes in and gives you their pitch and you have that pitch day of company after company, how important is it to know sort of or at least get a sense of the morals of that leader? What's interesting is that it ends up coming out a lot in the application phase. A lot about how they talk about their company, how they talk about their past in the application kind of gives you a sense of their morals. When we do interviews, it's not really a pitch, it's more of an interview. Yeah. So um, it's, it's less there, but it's, it's interesting what people will write in an application. Like, they will write some pretty interesting things. <laughs> <laughs>
Now, um, I know that Y Combinator is very, very early seed stage investment, um, but what I do at CNBC is typically watch this progression going from the seed stage until that big IPO moment. And there have been several big IPO <laughs> moments this year, some good, some not very good at all. And you sort of see this, these two tracks. You have the Uber and Lyfts that are losing so much money, and you have sort of the Zooms and the software and the enterprise companies that are doing very, very well in public markets. Is that something you think about in the earliest stages, how this might be received, what their end game is? Do you want companies to ultimately go public, or do you care if they're acquired instead? I mean, interestingly enough, it takes so long. You know, from when we write a check to when we expect a company to have a great exit, it might be 10 to 15 years. Mm -hmm. A lot of our focus is on, are they actually solving a problem for their customer, and do they actually understand their customer? I think that, like, when we talk to our post-product market fit companies, we have this program called the YC Growth Program where we actually help them hire and like train executives and kind of learn how to set up HR policies and all the things you need to do when actually building a company. And I think at that point, we really engage in a conversation with them about where they want to go, where they want to take this, and how they set themselves up for success. But at the extreme early stage, you know, product market fit's just binary. And so you know, we kind of tell them, like, Stay really small, stay really lean, and just focus on serving your customer. Adora, how long are you involved with a company? Do they come back to you after their Series D, Series uh, E? We're involved with them from beginning to end, okay. whether <laughs> they die or whether they IPO. Um, and so, like, real quick, we, we're often the first check in the company. We have a, once they're ready for a Series A program, we help them. Um, we also invest Series B and above. And we, like Michael said, we have a growth program where we're over 50 employees. We help you scale. Um, some of the biggest challenges then are usually not coding, but hiring and, mm -hmm. and firing and stuff like that. So then you guys are in the perfect position to answer the question, <laughs> are companies staying private for too long? There is so much money now in private markets. You've got the addition of SoftBank, which has a $100 billion fund just to invest in techs in the late stage, making it possible for companies to stay private for much longer. But you see, when they go public, sometimes their best growth days are behind the company. <laughs> so you think about who's getting rich from these companies, and it kind of goes against the philosophies that you guys have set right? You want to better the world. Mm -hmm. But for example, when you have an Uber go public after it's about a decade old, it's making its earliest shareholders very rich. It's not making its drivers rich, and it's not making a lot of the public rich in terms of that trajectory and public market investors being able to invest. So, you know, are companies staying private for too long? Yeah, Dora, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I think founders have the ambition to IPO, at least the ones we invest in. And so whether they need to stay public or not, or whether, sorry, whether they need to stay private or not, is not just a function of their ambition, but also the many people around them, what's good for the employees, what's good for the investors. And so from our perspective, I mean, the, one of the reasons why we don't have a very strong opinion on this is because we're just so focused on the founder, him or herself, that, um, yeah, that, that we, we, don't, we don't give an opinion, I guess, on those kind of things. Michael, anything to add there? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's the founder's decision. I think that there are lots of bad parts about going public um, that give a lot of founders pause and that haven't been reformed. So I kind of separated out, like, whether or not Uber goes public at whatever time, I think of as less important. I think of as more important is that they have a positive relationship with their drivers. I do think that Uber could have been in the position of being the largest effective employer in America um, if they really actually put their drivers first. And unfortunately, I think the history of Uber is slightly in opposition to their drivers, which is sad. I feel like Uber's whole story could have been cast in a different light if it was seen as a job creator. Right, but I would also argue that Lyft at the same time has done a much better job with their drivers introducing tipping from the beginning, but still got a lot of the same complaints. Yeah, but the stat that I look at is driver turnover. And like, if you have over 90% of your workers turning over every year, you got a problem. Yeah, there's a, something's going wrong, right? <laughs> now we, we've taken up all the time, but I want to get to a question that I'm just personally very curious about. We hear about all the companies that you guys did not pass on. You cut a check for in the very early days, you know, Airbnb, Stripe, many, many more. What are some of the companies you passed on? And not you specifically in Y Combinator's history that has grown into something that maybe you didn't see or maybe you're happy you passed on, like an Uber. 
or I don't think you'd be happy you passed on that. <laughs> it would have given you a lot of money. But just, you know, what's what's So we tracked this, on? actually. Um, we have this file called Misses. And I think the biggest miss is probably SendGrid. What is it? SendGrid, exactly. It's a good company, but it's not okay. the most famous. So we're pretty good. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, you know, historically we've been pretty good at, at picking the right companies. So Travis Kalanick or John Zimmer, Logan Green, the Lyft and Uber eyes, they never passed through. They never Why applied Combinator. to YC, no. It, do you think it would have been different for them if they had? I think we would have had a lot of interesting advice for them. <laughs> I, I don't doubt it. Um, guys, thank you so much. And if the audience could please help me in thanking Adora and Michael. Awesome. Thank you. So the truth is that there is no perfect recipe for innovation and technology. But if there was, I think our next guest would have the ultimate formula. This is a man who is creating a new model for corporate innovation at Samsung, a company whose products and technologies touch all facets of our daily life. Please welcome, speaking with, from Wired, Ariel Pardez, Samsung's chief innovation officer and president of Samsung Next, David Un. David, thank you so much for being here. Good to be here, thanks. I want to talk today about innovation. I want to talk about the trends in technology that are driving innovation. And I want to talk about how a company with the size and scale of Samsung can compete with the agility and speed of a startup in trying to stay innovative. But first, uh, David, let's hear a little bit about you as you have a very interesting vantage point when it comes to innovating. You are the president of Samsung Next. You are the chief innovation officer at Samsung. And I think many of us know Samsung because we have Samsung devices in our homes and in our pockets. Um, but your job is a little different. So tell us a little bit about what you do and how you approach innovation in your role. Sure. So uh, one of the, and I've, I've, I've talked about this before, but one of the paradoxes of corporate life is that even for the most successful companies, you always have to think about moving forward, thinking about what's next, what are the growth areas. And uh, if you don't innovate and move forward, if you're standing still, you, you will fail. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, the, the dilemma is that, especially with the bigger companies, the successful companies, oftentimes what has made you successful, what is at the core of what you do can become so big it can become a blind spot to what's around the corner, where the growth opportunities are. And um, this is where Samsung Next comes in. Um, we are an innovation group within Samsung, and we are purposely built uh, to focus on innovations in software and services that could complement Samsung's historic expertise in hardware and consumer electronics. And we do this by having an exclusive focus on startups and mm -hmm. entrepreneurs, which is why we're here. Uh, and in all under one roof, we have a venture capital team, we have a business development and partnerships team, we have an M&A team, and we have a product development team, 
all aligned around one goal, and that is really understanding and working with the best entrepreneurs out there to identify new services that could benefit Samsung and vice versa. Um, and uh, that's what we do at Samsung Next, uh, and that's why we're here, as I, as I said. Cool. I want to talk about some of the things that you're interested in when you are looking ahead in the future and thinking about uh, trends that will benefit Samsung. And I want to start with one that I think everyone in the room is very familiar with, um, which is artificial intelligence. Obviously, this is something that's woven through many of the products that Samsung is producing. And Samsung has invested quite heavily in, in AI. I know you've earmarked uh, $22 billion over the next few years toward uh, edge technologies like AI. Yep. Tell us about why that's so important to you at Samsung and what you're investing in specifically. Yeah, so I, I think we've stated publicly we're going to invest $22 billion over the next three years in, uh, in 5G and AI. And um, many people kind of know this, but they don't. But we sell over 500 million displays a year. And our goal is to have every single one of those displays with some form of intelligence in them. Uh, now, it's still early days in AI and, and, and development. And much of what we've seen in AI is very much focused, as many of you in the audience may know, on machine learning. Mm. Um, but there are many different approaches to AI. And while machine learning is uh, uh, fantastic and, and has created a lot of great outputs and benefits so far, uh, these different approaches, we think, are, are, are very promising. And so um, uh, uh, a few years ago, we launched, in fact, last year, we launched a, a fund just focused on early stage AI startups called the Q Fund uh, with the idea of, uh, of opening up and interacting with different approaches to AI, uh, different startups who are trying to address uh, different issues and problems uh, along the whole value chain applications. What's an example of something that was funded with the Q Fund? Uh, so uh, there's, there's many examples, but uh, one, one example uh, that we have is a company called Missing Link. Uh, it's, it's based in Israel and in San Francisco. And uh, what they are doing is providing tools for developers to create more efficiency in the way uh, they harness and work with AI data. And so a lot of people don't know this if you don't work in it, but uh, when you take something like machine learning, it really is scaling and getting your arms around huge volumes of data. Mm. Uh, and that can be a very cumbersome, sometimes inefficient process. So we are providing tools and approaches that make it much more efficient and easier. Let's talk about some consumer trends. Uh, since a lot of what you do is, is sort of gazing out into the future and sort of predicting what people will be doing with technology three, five, 10, 15 years down the road, what is exciting you right now when you think about the future for consumers? Yeah, so in my role as a chief innovation officer, what uh, I and my team try to do is identify long-term consumer and tech trends mm -hmm. that are gonna affect people and businesses globally. And um, a lot of times people focus on what I would call like features or kind of neat functionality and technology, which is great. Uh, but what we've been doing more recently is, is going a little bit deeper on the fundamentals of how people are seeing the world and, and behaving. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the, uh, the things that we're observing I, I call experiences over things. And essentially what is happening, especially with younger consumers around the world, and, and not just in the US or North America, Canada, et cetera, around the world, is that younger consumers are valuing experiences over things. And, and by experiences, I mean authentic social experiences rather than purchasing you know, transactional items. Mm. It doesn't mean that they won't buy things, but the things are a means to a greater end. And in fact, if you look at the data, there's four times more spending in things. When you do the research, uh, something like close to 80% of all millennials uh, are predicting that they will spend more money on things, um, on doing things rather than buying things. And you, you look no further than, you know, whether they're live events or going out to eat or gathering together with friends, you know, what you would call these Instagrammable moments. Um, they're Instagrammable not uh, because they're just interesting, they're interesting because they're inherently social and more compelling. And what our research indicates is that 
when you have these kind of memories and these experiences, when you look back, they're more apt to have positive associations. Um, it's more closely linked to people's sense of happiness, of satisfaction. And so, so why is that important? Well, whether you're selling a car or selling luxury goods or selling TVs or services of any sort, the idea that of pushing the thing versus pushing what can be enabled by the thing, the experiences, is really important. And as we internalize that, you know, it makes us think about how the physical and the digital worlds are coming together, combined with the focus on experiences, and not surprisingly, you're seeing these huge trends, these activities and services that are really popping. Um, so, for example, the idea of owning things is receding and having access to things to have the experience is more prominent. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to buy the music, you don't have to buy the video content, you can have a subscription right. to a Spotify or a Netflix, right? You don't have to buy a car necessarily if you can get access to it through an Uber or a Lyft, even clothing, right? So uh, we have a, a startup uh, investment in Germany called Grover, and what they essentially do is they turn every transaction into something that could be subscription-nizable. So you could effectively have access to something without necessarily buying it. And obviously for consumer electronics, it's very big, but there, there are scenarios where essentially if you want to stay mobile and stay light, you, you don't have to buy the apartment you live in and the bed, the table, the utensils, everything that you have could be more of an access mm. uh, to it through subscription. So when we think about this and it's happening globally, it really thinks, it makes us think about, well, if you are in the startup space and you know that consumers are headed and developing that way, right. um, not, only how, not only are there questions about product development, but marketing and branding and the way you communicate who you are and what you do. Yeah. I want to return really briefly to your idea of experiences over things, because I think this is so interesting and you can see it happening uh, industry-wide. Yeah. Samsung is obviously a company that has a big business in selling hardware. You sell TVs and phones and appliances. Um, so if the trend is that people are investing less in these physical things and more in what you can do on them, you have a big incentive to find and nurture these services that people are excited about. Um, what are some examples of the things that you're excited about when you think about people investing in those experiences? Yeah, so, um, well, the good news is that for one to have great experiences, things are important. <laughs> um, and uh, with, this, with this combination of the physical and the digital, mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we look at the house and we think mm -hmm. there are amazing transformations that are already uh, beginning to happen that will, will continue. So one example is the kitchen, right? Um, if you look at the kitchen itself and you look, at around, uh, look around at your appliances, for the most part, there haven't been huge tectonic shifts in innovation. Uh, but when you look at the behaviors and the way people spend their time and, and, their, and create experiences, you know, a kitchen used to be where you cooked, a dining room is where you would eat, and a living room is where you would hang out. Mm -hmm. And today, for many people, it's all kind of come together mm. in the kitchen. Mm. Uh, I mean, how many of you all have breakfast nooks or uh, kitchen islands in your homes, right? Uh, how many of you, when you have friends over, spend a large or disproportionate amount of time in the kitchen? And so as we think about the kitchen, we think about having experiences and enabling those experiences. Uh, we just acquired a company uh, based in London called Whisk, and they're essentially a food slash kitchen platform where they allow consumers to find online recipes, so to be inspired to, ha dis to discover, to go all the way to executing restaurant quality meals. Mm -hmm. So they have relationships with publishers and people who own uh, uh, recipes to people who have uh, websites and apps that consumers use to retail so you can uh, easily buy the ingredients of things to preparation. And you're seeing now tremendous innovations even in appliances. You know, so you can easily cook really delicious quality meals and have great experiences around them. So we think you know, what might have been even overlooked before 
uh, like the kitchen, is a huge opportunity for entrepreneurs in hardware, software, and services to really speak to consumers and, and build very promising businesses. Absolutely. So this example you just gave, Whisk, this is an acquisition. That's right. Um, so you do acquisitions, you also do early stage investments. That's right. Um, Tell us a little bit about how these companies feed back into the Samsung ecosystem. Obviously, you're looking at things that will enhance the experience of using Samsung products, but sort of what does that mean when you acquire or invest in one of these smaller startups that's doing something interesting? Yeah, I, mean, I, I think one of the big insights or lessons learned, I think, of us and, and perhaps other, other companies is that big companies do things a certain way that, that have helped them become successful. And there are approaches and processes and cultures that form. And oftentimes they're very different from startups. Mm -hmm. right? So uh, I spent the earlier years of my career in media. And now I work for a large, let's say, hardware consumer electronics company. And in those industries, uh, when you offer a product up, you want it to be as perfect as possible. Mm -hmm. Because once you broadcast the show or you know, put the refrigerator in retail uh, stores, it, you can't change it. It's got to be as perfect as it can be. Of course, on software, you have almost the opposite mentality, right? You launch early and you iterate. And oftentimes, you use your users, you, you leverage their expertise and their feedback to identify bugs and fixes to improve your product. So given that the cultures and approaches are so different, what we try to do when we uh, make an acquisition is think beforehand, even as we're doing due diligence, of what, the, what we call the PMI looks like, the post-merger integration like plan. What happens after the acquisition? If you consider the acquisition day one, well, what happens on day two? And for those of you who are entrepreneurs and, and are, are in startups, that's a really important question. Uh, and so, and, and uh, we, we don't want to kind of mess with the magic in a way, but we also want them to uh, learn new things and have access uh, to have uh, integration to the scale and the resources of the large company, which is one of the reasons why they wanted to get together. So striking that balance is not always easy to do, but it's essential. Mm. And for those of you who are in startups, you know, when you think about uh, the huge goal of having an exit, and, and maybe that includes an acquisition, you know, one of the things I would strongly recommend is you really look at acquisition. I mean, sure, it's a great success event, a, a reason for celebration, but in a way, a form of business development, a, a way of getting to the next stage of fulfilling even bigger goals for why you created the startup or joined the startup in the first place. And I think if you partner and ac get acquired by the right type of company, um, they can provide you with tremendous leverage. Mm. And, and that's what we try to do. Absolutely. Um, I want to pivot really quickly to ask you about something that's a little, a little to the left of what we've been talking about, and that's uh, diversity. Just because when I think about innovation and staying ahead of the curve, it seems so central that you're not just looking uh, to people who are like-minded and come from similar backgrounds, but you're looking all over and seeing who has the best ideas and who can contribute. That's the diversity alarm. <laughs> <laughs> that is a signal for how important this topic is. Uh, it's coming at like a regular beat, a cadence. I could wrap my answer to you, but I won't. I'm not sure what that is. Okay. Uh, yeah, that there's, there's a very big truck backing into the stage right now. This we're, is so it's odd. Merge. It's all part of our <laughs> planned interaction. Uh, should we okay, talk should through I, it? Should I try to talk through it? Yeah. We're going to try to talk through it. I apologize. Okay. So, but um, how, does, how does Samsung approach that question of trying to invest uh, diversely? Right. Well, <laughs> at, at Samsung Next, one of the things that we realize, because we have offices all over the world, um, is especially as you're trying to think about what's around the corner or where the new growth opportunities are, you want to try to bring to the table as many interesting, varied perspectives as possible. And you know, a lot of times, uh, especially bigger companies, they turn diversity 
into something that, I mean, there's good intent in it, but they mm. turn it into like a, a feel-good issue mm. or a goal. And if that's the case, you know, uh, fine, but what you're really not focusing on is why it's essential for business, why it can be a tremendous difference maker, uh, especially if you're in the business of reaching out to consumers directly. Um, so what, what we do is when we think about diversity is, of course, we want to bring more women into technology. We want to bring more underrepresented people of color. But we're also looking for people who grew up in different backgrounds, people who have different perspectives, uh, people who, have, frankly, have different personalities. And this can, be, this can be challenging because sometimes when you think about, oh, is this person who you're trying to recruit or interviewing a cultural fit, mm. while that can be good, sometimes having people who, you know, are, are not jerks, but have a different mode of interacting can be a really interesting, productive thing. Mm. And sometimes the sparks that fly can lead to really interesting things. So as we think about diversity, we think about it on, on many different dimensions. And we think it's critical if, if we're supposed to um, be an innovation group and we want to identify uh, things that people perhaps haven't really thought of before or executed in a, in a particular way. Yeah. Do you have any specific examples of ways that you're investing specifically in diversity, though? Uh, <laughs> This beefing is very distracting. <laughs> so, I think this is just going to continue, right? I so think it's we'll going to, should we wrap? Uh, I can try to talk through it. Hey! All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Sorry, what was the question again? Just in case you were wondering, that was a fire alarm. That was. <laughs> All right. Well, I think we have time for just one more question. Okay. And the last thing I want to ask you is. No, 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 no. So what I think we're going to do is we're just going to pause the clock, let this run its course. We don't think there's any real issue, and then we'll just resume. Yeah, do you want to, do you want to come back with me? There's yeah. a yeah. clock here. It's like a we, shot clock. We reset like the time for you. It's perfect.
civilization will grow in ways you can't possibly imagine, and it will change us forever. These companies have incredible power. You've got to hold the companies to account. Data demands that there be regulation. It's not being seen to do the right thing. It's about actually doing the right thing. This future is arriving so fast that it becomes increasingly difficult to say what shape it will take. The tools that we've created have been turned by others into weapons. Here's the problem. Facebook, it has so much power. It is making a digital clone of our society. We cannot remain silent in this century. We need to do a better job of creating a really safe and inclusive workplace. Build teams of people who believe in something bigger than just what they're working on. This is the biggest opportunity. This is hope. Across the vastness of time, the future calls out to us. And we must answer. WebSum was massive. I mean, the ability to sell our vision to a crowd of 18,000 people, it was very cool. The experience has been amazing. We created great connections with people. You know, we hope that, you know, we're a good alumni to show all the different stages that a young company goes through. And every time we come here, we learn something new, something more, and, and we recalibrate. Pitching on center stage was amazing. You know, the exposure in front of 15,000 people, but also you guys brought some of the best investors here. I am tired of people saying they just can't find good diverse entrepreneurs to fund. You can address a lot of that, I think, by coming to a conference that has invested the time to make sure you've got diverse people here to network with. The winner of the pitch competition was able to capture the imagination of if this work, it's going to be really big. I think it's a huge opportunity for people who are just setting up their companies to meet the most interesting people. I'd encourage every startup to get involved. It's a unique opportunity to meet here in Hong Kong where East meets West, Old meets new. This is the place to come to see the best new startups across Asia. This is the hottest emerging area in the world right now. To have a conference of this size that brings talent of this quality from all over the world matters a lot. It reminds me of something out of Star Wars, like a city of the future. We live in a world where innovation is actually on the rise everywhere. For me, there's hope for the future. This new generation of people, new generation of companies, it is changing the world of technology. It's changing the world. Imagine for a moment that future generations could reach back in time to speak to you. What would they say? Would they despair? Stop. You've no idea what's yet to come. Or would they give hope? Never stop trying for a better tomorrow. Keep imagining, believing, dreaming. Would they tell us of new machines, the secrets of progress? Would they plead with us to care for our world? The very nature of communication will grow in ways you can't possibly imagine, and it will change us. Yeah, remind, remind, I was reminded of just with this fire, fire drill, uh, but sometimes things don't happen like you planned, right? <laughs> sometimes the unexpected happens, and uh, you just have to roll with it. And a, a lot of being successful as an entrepreneur 
is rolling with those changes and having the kind of resilience to, to overcome. Uh, but the, the one piece of advice I would share with, with you all is that um, you know, working in a startup and being an entrepreneur can be so all-consuming. We know this. And because you're thinking about what you're doing in your product and the, and the things that you're trying to accomplish, uh, what I would suggest to you is when you interact with other folks, and it could be uh, a potential customer, when you th or it could be thinking about your ultimate user, it could be a, a potential investor, uh, it could be someone who's a journalist, um, just remind yourself to... <laughs> just remind yourself to roll with it. Just remind yourself <laughs> to really put yourself in, in, in the shoes of the other person. So rather than thinking about all the messages and all the things that you want to tick off to, to give out, really thinking, think about what they need to hear, what, mm. what they want to hear um, as well. So it's really being, in that sense, user-centric mm. in, in every interaction. Because I, I find sometimes, and this happens in, in you'll, you'll find this even in partnership discussions, you hear a lot from them what they want from you, but not necessarily what they can give to you, mm. right? So it seems common sense, but um, you'd be surprised at how often people forget that. And, and that you understand why, because you're, you've been so focused on getting your message out or making sure people understand the beauty of what you're trying to do that you, you, you miss that. And, and this goes uh, for recruiting people. It goes to having uh, conversations at a tailgate or a, or a barbecue and, and someone asks you what you do, really trying to put yourself in that frame of mind. So that's what I would say. Um, I heard this quote, and maybe this is a way we could end the quote. I, I heard this quote recently, and, and it really, I, I really like it, and uh, I don't know if you all have heard it, but it's about uh, what being an entrepreneur is. Being a successful entrepreneur means doing today what others will not do, so tomorrow you can do what others cannot do. Mm. And uh, I really like that, so I wish you all the best. Thank you so Thanks, much, Ariel. David. Thank you. Better get off the stage before we set off any more alarms. I bet you that panel was just ready to get off stage. Really sorry about that. I hope that's the end of that. So next up, we're delighted to have uh, two of the tech industry's leading minds. As well as being the co-founder of Twitter and Medium, Ev Williams is known for his searingly honest opinion of the industry. And the woman who's going to be interviewing him is known for holding that very industry accountable for its actions. So without further ado, please welcome executive editor of Recode, Kara Swisher, and founder and CEO of Medium, Ev Williams. Hi, everybody. Sorry Hello. about that fire thing. That was Kara backstage. That was Kara. I just didn't want to go on with this guy. Um, actually, if that goes off again, I'm going to lose it. Um, anyway, we're here with Ev, who I've known for forever. Um, seems like it. Seems like it. Uh, and I want to talk about a lot of things. But let's start, first of all, it's called After Twitter. Uh, um, yeah, it's not very dramatic. I've been on the board since there was a board, so approximately 12, 13 years, and, um, and only on the board for the last 10 or so. So it's, or however, nine. Mm -hmm. um, so I stayed on the board as long as I thought um, I could be helpful, mostly. And um, the company is a really good place now um, compared to some of the time it's, it's been before. And I just felt like I want to spend my time on energy on other things. So. Was it overwhelming for you, like the issues you all face there around hate, around President Trump, around mostly President Trump, really? <laughs> well, um, I mean, you know, being on the board is not being at the company. Right. And so um, while it's called Life After Twitter, I kind of laugh because it's kind of been Life After Twitter for me for a long time. Yes. And I'll always be associated with the company, always be rooting for it. I, still a shareholder of the company. So there's certain part of my, my year is no longer spent in Twitter board meetings, but 
Um, I've been focusing my time on other things for a long time. All right, I want to get to the things you're doing, but what do you, where, where do you think it is right now as, as a medium, the whole social media space? It's obviously been under attack uh, quite heavily. I don't assume you're going to write a Chris Hughes-like document for the New York Times, correct? <laughs> Calling no. Jack no. un-American or anything no. like that. No. no. Sorry, I didn't hear where, the question. Where do you think in... social media is right now and what where it needs to it do is? to fix itself? I mean, it's, it's in the, you know, the bleakness of, of figuring out what, where, it, where it needs to go. I think the... Um, um, I don't have any answers as to how we get out of, of the current situation, but I think we, there's a tendency to say, oh, social media is terrible and right. forget all the great things about it, which I still believe are true. And I believe the terrible things are true because social media is humanity and right. it amplifies, unfortunately, it amplifies a lot of bad aspects of humanity. Um, it's very powerful at that, um, and very powerful at connecting people with terrible ideas and amplifying those and making them seem like they're good ideas. Um, on the other hand, it does the opposite, and it, and um, and I think we are. I think there is a better version of social media to be invented, and I don't know if that will happen incrementally because there's lots of smart people trying to evolve these systems at, at these massive companies, or if it will happen with just completely new paradigms and new ideas that come along. Um, I'm confident it will remain around, but I think also people's relationship and, and sort of the novelty and the, some of the excitement that brought, it, brought us to is wearing off. It's like it a sugar high. And now way. we're like, oh, do we need this in our life in right. the same way? Right. And do you... Um, do you imagine, let's get to new companies, because you're an investor with Obvious Ventures. You're not really investing in that space. We don't all. really, no. Why is that? Um, it's not that we wouldn't, but um, at Obvious Ventures, we, we focus on what we, what we consider, uh, what we call world positive investing, which is things that we think address big systemic problems we face as a society. We haven't seen something come along, and, and we don't do actually very many internet or media things. We do a little bit, but we, we do things more in health and wellness and sustainability. So world positive, that's a, that's a very techie word. What does that mean? Cause, cause well, it's just I, our term before things, like we have a lens. We're, a, we're not an impact investor, we're a for-profit investor because that, that doesn't compromise on financial returns because, but we're very genuinely focused on things that we think are, are big ideas and big solutions. So why don't you want to call it impact investing? Because that's what it's called. I mean, impact investing can be great, just, but right. impact investing uh, historically is a view that we will take a lesser financial return in order to have some sort of other impact. Right. And which there, there's investments that make sense for that. Our, our view is that the biggest, um, the biggest companies that scale the most are not going to have, they're going to have big returns. Mm -hmm. And so rather than say, we're going to compromise on returns, we feel like that can be a failure mode and say like, actually it's not that healthy of a company or it doesn't have great product market fit. We're, we're saying, no, it has to be, it has to be great. So an example, uh, one of our companies is Beyond Meat, which, which, is, really well on. which has done phenomenal. And we, it's not an impact investment, it's a phenomenally lucrative profitable investment that, that addresses this massive need of lowering our, our carbon footprint when it comes to the what's, meat we eat. What's really interesting is that Beyond Meat is doing great in the stock market and Uber is tanking and Lyft is tanking all I wouldn't have of, predicted that necessarily I would not a have few predicted years that. ago. So talk about how you got into this, the, the, the Beyond Meat, because there's also Impossible Foods. There's yep. a lot of food invest, food tech investing, I yeah. guess, if you want. Um, Beyond Meat was one of the first investments we did. We actually rolled it into Obvious Ventures. Biz and I, you know, my longtime partner, Biz, was a vegan for a long time. Some Kleiner Perkins did the Series A and Beyond Meat. I think because they knew he was a vegan, they're like, hey, are you interested in this company? Mm -hmm. And so, so he brought it to us, and we were very excited about it. We love the products. I've uh, been vegan and pescatarian for a long time. And Wait, which one are you? I, I was vegan, now I'm pescatarian. So, okay. Um, and, but I haven't eaten a land animal for a very long time, so, okay. so I enjoyed the products. Biz enjoyed the products. We're, you and just draw the line at fish? I draw the line at fish. All right, okay. Yeah. And um, 
Um, and Ethan Brown, the CEO and founder of Beyond Me, is just an incredible human. Mm -hmm. And so we backed him fairly early on. And when, at the time you did it, there wasn't a lot of people interested in that sector. And there, there was investments, but it was more on yeah. the research side, a lot of the research stuff, and this is a yeah. small market. What did you hope, I'll get to the, the stock market thing, why did you go public with it and what did you hope for, it? that it would be in every supermarket or you're aiming at people who eat meat? Yeah, we, I mean, the goal with it, and the company's been around for a few years, um, and the goal with it was always... Um, to penetrate the meat market. And um, I mean that in the actual, the grocery right. store sense. Right. Um, and to, to really, imp that's a massive trillion dollar market that um, we thought there's a better alternative to. So we didn't have the plan for that. Ethan and his team had the plan, but it's, it's going well so far. So where do you imagine, like there's, there's a world, po I guess it would be world positive. How much pushback have you had from meat companies. I know they don't want you to call it meat because just the way the milk yeah. distributors don't want oat milk to be called yeah. oat milk or cashew milk. Or um, I, think, um, I think some of them see it as an opportunity and some of them see it as a threat, I would imagine. Tyson is in it, right? Tyson was actually a big investor and shareholder and, right. and they got out just before the IPO. Because they're making their own version. Yeah, I would assume any, any meat company. I mean, the, the re response to the Beyond Me IPO, which has been so gratifying, is that people are paying attention to this plant protein company that most people wouldn't have predicted would make such a big blip. And I think it's a lot of people seeing the potential. And in terms of when you think about these world positive things, talk about what your theories are of venture investing, because that's changed a lot. You know, you have the advent of giant, giant investors like SoftBank, yeah. which of course has gotten a bath in, in yeah. the Uber investment. Um, how do you look at investing then as a venture? How do you distinguish yourself? So ours, we, we kind of play a different game, I think, than most Silicon Valley investors. And, and first of all, it's our lens of, of filtering out a lot of things that that could be great investments, but if we don't think they really are are going to address some some need for society, we'll say that's okay. We, there's lots of others we'll focus on. So which eliminates most of enterprise software, mm -hmm. um, and and then and then also the message that entrepreneurs really appreciate is that we we are mission aligned, mm -hmm. and we will support an entrepreneur who is mission focused. Uh, which people come to us because they really like hearing that because as an entrepreneur you can be, and I've been in this position where you're, you're aligned with your investors in terms of wanting to build something really big, but you can get misaligned in terms of really the purpose of that thing. So what does that bring you to? What areas are you excited about in that regard? So we, we do a lot of stuff in um, sustainability from solar and solar software. We have... Um, we're investors in um, Proterra, the electric bus company. There's um, some other, another exit we just had was Ollie, which was, a, which was a supplement company. And so we tend to do things that are outside of, of the traditional Silicon Valley world that I know, which of course Silicon Valley is expanding greatly in terms of what they invest in, but um, it's not a lot of software or media. All right. When you, I'm going to get to medium in a second, but when you think about venture, I just interviewed Mark Cuban and Steve Case, um, and they were talking about the efforts they're making to get all around the world to try to get more talent from elsewhere. Right now, 80% of venture capital goes to three states, which and most of it to California and yeah. most of it to Silicon Valley. Continues to be all white, all male, um, not very geographically diverse, not mm -hmm. very globally diverse. Why does that continue from your perspective? Mm. Um, I think it's, it's, it's habit. Um, it's, it's definitely not the, the lack of viable investments that are outside the geography or demographics of that traditional set. Um, and so we, we aren't internationally focused. And one thing is that so much of the money is in Silicon Valley and the firms are there because they come out of, you know, it's historic. Right. And it is hard to invest in other places where you're not, there's just a time in the day problem. Mm -hmm. We have a couple investments in Europe, but not a lot. Um, and we have some, some in New York and throughout the country. But, but part of that, um, I, I certainly celebrate expanding the ethos and the, the the formula of Silicon Valley to other places, but um, 
it's, it's pretty massive and there's this perpetuating cycle. People come out of companies and they go back in and they invest in their friends. I get that, but why doesn't it happen? You're a very well-meaning person. You have a broad attitude toward diversity, but most people just talk about it and nothing happens in that regard. It seems like you're one, missing the boat, meaning there's lots of investments you're missing, and two, yeah. perpetuating something like this is not an excuse for doing that. Yeah, I, I agree. I don't, I don't see any excuse for doing it. We, we try very hard to, to invest. I don't know the data off the top of my head mm -hmm. about our portfolio. Mm -hmm. I know it, it is something that comes up in every partner meeting and every conversation I'm, I'm in about how we both hire in the firm, um, both women and people from underrepresented backgrounds. And we and how we get that into our portfolio, and and we work on it daily, and and my partners are very focused on that. But Do you think I don't Silicon have Valley has changed in attitude given the sort of this tech lash that's happening? I think it has dramatically. I mean, in my 20 years of building companies in Silicon Valley, the intensity of focus on diversity and inclusion in the last five years is dramatically higher. It's an order of magnitude higher, and it's changing how. Definitely how we invest, how we run companies, how we hire. It's changed all those things in my experience, and we have a long way to go. Yeah, the numbers still don't bear it out. It's really, I totally it's, agree. It's the strangest thing. Um, so when you think about uh, where the biggest, most interesting innovations are happening, where do, you, what, where do you tend towards right now? You're obviously in food tech. There's a lot of mobility stuff going on, and that's not mobile phones. Where do yeah. you think the hottest place to look at is? And where um, do you think the hype, the worst place right now is? Well, it, me, I don't spend that much time looking, looking at investments, to tell you the truth. Mm -hmm. I spend more of my time on Medium, which maybe we should talk about that. Wait, yes, I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to get that right now. Um, but I mean, I think obviously AI is infiltrating everything we do, and there's some very interesting things. We're actually, there's an overlap of AI and um, material and molecule discovery, right. um, which I'll probably butcher this if I, if I try to even explain it. One of our companies is, is Zymergen, which is based on, which is just doing mind-blowing things and inventing new, discovering new materials and new chemicals through right. AI. And so that's a field that I barely understand. And um, I think every time I learn more about it is doing incredible things. And there's a All number right. of companies like Medium. that. Yes. What's happening with Medium now? When last we talked, you were, you changed it about 63 times, like in the way you're looking about it. How do you look at it right now? How, what do you think of it as? Um, I, I would argue I have not changed it 63 times, although um, I do you defend my, my need I don't to mind it. Mind. I don't care if you change it. <laughs> um, we, we haven't changed that many things about Medium. Medium's been around for about seven years. Mm -hmm. Um, the entire time it's been an open publishing platform that has grown that entire time. Mm -hmm. um, so m more people write, more people read. Uh, two years ago, we, we started building a subscription business right. on top of that. That's been going very well. And so over the last two years, the main thing we've done is built this premium consumer subscription business um, on top of the open publishing platform. So it's really a mesh of those two things that allows anyone to publish, have a voice, um, potentially get paid. We pay thousands of writers from all over the world every, every week, um, and that's a growing amount. And, and then we have a professional editorial team, and then we also work with third-party publishers. So we, we do all that. Would, you, 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 would it be right to say you've pushed off of the professional stuff more and tended more towards different writers? Has that not worked as well, or what part has worked the best? Everything's growing. The, the bulk of Medium is still self-published authors. Right. And um, that's what, and we have our, our partner program where we pay them through. Most, most people write on Medium. We don't, right. don't opt in to get paid. Um, they're, they're looking to find audience. We also have a very um, growing editorial team that is publishing the latest thing we've been doing is, is starting these little publications or right. mini magazines around a variety of topics. We've been doing that both in-house and through partners like Mark Bittman mm -hmm. and Roxanne Gay. We just right. launched something with a couple weeks ago. And so all of that is working. And it's really the combination of things that are working because in, it's very clear to me that 
advertising isn't working, pure advertising right. for, for publishing, for quality information, people still want good things to read and, and to inform their view of the world. And so every publisher that, as, as you know, is putting up paywalls and subscriptions, and it seems very clear that people aren't going to subscribe to dozens That's of right. sites. Just like they don't subscribe to every TV show they watch or every musician, mm -hmm. they're, they're going to look for a, 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 a lot of value under one subscription that's personalized, that's high quality, that I think ad free is tremendously um, well, they're doing that in different. podcasts. They're trying to bring together podcasts. They are. I mean, we're much farther along than anyone doing that in podcasts. Do you consider yourself a network then? And how would you describe yourself as a media company? We're, we're, you could call it a network, and Medium's always been a network. It's really a, a, a platform, and the subscription part is a bundle. It's a bundle right. of mm -hmm. thousands of writers, of dozens right. of publications uh, for one price. Some of that is licensed, by the way, from third-party publishers. So we, have, we include... New York Times, Financial Times, Bloomberg, right. a lot of these, part of just a few stories from them are in there. And so really, it's, what, our goal is to build the best uh, content subscription product that it, there is. Do you, are you, do you think yourself of buying big media companies, all the others, a lot of Lorraine Powell Jobs, um, uh, Mark, Mark Benioff, obviously Jeff Bezos yep. and others with some money have been purchasing things. There was a rumor you were looking at New York Magazine. Um, is that true? It's true. There was a rumor about that. Yeah. <laughs> um, and oh, uh, I love out. New York Magazine. I think they do a great job. And look, I, I think it is something I've thought about because right. I think there's a lot of those organizations that do great work and they need a new model, frankly. And a lot of them are... Um, I think will we'll be fine, but, but there, a lot of them are, are going through more difficult times. The difference between myself and most of the people you mentioned is um, I think if, if, if we were to do that, it would plug into the business I'm building. So what do you imagine, um, finishing up, what the, the modern media company looks like? What's been the thing that you've done and you've thought, ah, that's not the way it should go? What do you think a modern media company looks like? Because you could yeah. go and buy old media companies yeah. and try to. Get yeah, them I don't going. think that's. I think a modern media company. If we we think. Um, I think the idea of being open to some degree is important, and this is where we're really trying to capture the best of what you get from the internet and from being from social media in many ways, which is giving a lot of people the chance to be heard. But it's not guaranteed. It's not, it's not just let the machines and, and algorithms and people fight it out for attention. Mm -hmm. It's really blending openness. So not Twitter, right? No. Not, not Twitter, and, but it's, it's, um, we just serve a very different purpose. So the modern media company, if you're, if you're building a publisher today, with, given the internet, I think it'd be crazy to limit yourself to the people in the building or the people who you, sure. who you know. And so we have the good fortune of getting tens of thousands of people every single day saying, here's my story, here's my idea, here's my perspective, and we curate that, and, and sometimes we, we edit it and we put it in front of more people, and then we also get the benefit of working with, with people who are well-established, and we, so, so a modern me blending humans and, and machines. So we've seen, we've seen the pure open platform, um, what, what that gives us in terms of content, and we've seen that the, the traditional world and how that can be limited in terms of scale and efficiency. Mm -hmm. And so I think the, the next version is gonna blend those things, that's what we're trying to do. And are you positive about media? Because it's still in its long death swoon, which still, they still haven't killed off media, and it's been more popular, reading is more popular, television is more popular. Yeah. Do you, do, are you worried about media? About media in general, do you think the changes that are being made are? I'm very optimistic. I think I think it's interesting that the written word and publishing, which we're currently focused on, though not limited to, is kind of the last to be. You know, there's there's a time when it was going to be the death of the music industry, and there's a time it was never, as I recall, the death of the TV industry. But there's a time when the the when reality TV dominated, and um, that's what we kind of thought the future was. And both those are tremendously better, both as, as, as businesses and as consumer products. And I think the same thing, for the same reason, can happen with the information we read and nonfiction. I'm not sure we're going to do after that. Um, yeah. But you, you still are positive.
That, made right. that is the game that we've been playing for 20 years, and it wasn't so bad at first, and now attention wins, period. The cheapest way you can generate attention, which is the same reason that reality TV dominated. Change the business model, you change the content. To me, people talk about saving publishing or saving news. How about we create something way better? And I think we can do that in the same way other industries do by changing the incentive structure. So that would make kind of Twitter and Facebook reality television in a weird way, because that's where a lot of people the get The reality TV version of the internet will exist in, you know, and for a long time, just the reality TV version. I think Facebook and Twitter are distribution systems for content more than they are content themselves, and social media is a whole other thing. But I'm talking about publishing, and, and even, even when, when people are talking about where they get their news and information, if most things people read are on other sites that are commercially published and driven by advertising. All right, last question. Do you think you'll go public with Medium? Uh, it's too soon to say, but if we do, I would like to go on the long-term stock exchange, another obvious investment. All right. All right. But, we'll talk about that later. Thank you, Gavin. Right. Thanks, Gar. Okay, so listen, next up, we have one of Silicon Valley's veritable godfathers. In the late 1990s, this man and his three colleagues co-founded PayPal. And now, he's back on the cutting edge of fintech with his company, Affirm. So here to talk to Zoe Bernard from The Information, please welcome founder and CEO of Affirm, Max Levchin. So good morning, every, morning, afternoon, I guess. Um, so Max Levchin is a uh, veteran in Silicon Valley. He has been in the fintech space for 20 years. And kind of off and on, right? You were at PayPal, and then you were at Slide, and now you're back in fintech with Affirm. Can you kind of give an overview of what Affirm is? Sure. Uh, it started out as a pretty pointed project to build a better credit score. I've uh, always felt that FICO, which is used worldwide, but certainly in North America, to score credit has been behind the times, shall we say, in a sense that it represents new forms of credit and payment behavior poorly. And so my co-founders and I wanted to just build something that would be a little bit more dynamic, a little bit better work for people that were not anticipated when it was originally designed like immigrants, which I am one of, uh, or students, you know, people like that who are now entering the, the, the credit space and borrowing. And as we started doing it, we realized that there's a bigger opportunity in the space, one, to reinvent point of sale behaviors where as young people are entering uh, you know, workforce and therefore earning money and therefore buying things and their lives are changing, they are no longer trusting credit cards. They're no longer trusting traditional financial products. And as a result, we built what we thought would be the honest, more transparent answer, more trustworthy answer to, uh, to, to buying. And so we've built this fairly large company at this point where a firm will provide a new form of payment, a simple, transparent, super convenient installment loan to buy anything that's a, uh, a considered purchase, something that you have to think twice about just sort of dropping some cash on. That, that's where we started, and at this point, uh, we see our mission as fundamentally reimagining most financial products. And your consumer base is largely millennials, is that right? Um, it's mostly young people, uh, in a sense that we start out thinking that only millennials are going to be willing to reconsider their financial options and uh, trust a brand new startup that no one's ever heard of at the time. It turned out that uh, many more people than just millennials were fed up with the financial institutions of today and um, 
I think about 70% of our user base is Gen X or younger, so it does appeal to younger population. But 30% is everybody but those. And so we seem to have found appeal across the board. So when you think about winning the trust of younger consumers and establishing a brand with them that they're going to continue using for a while, um, how do you do that? You know, the company was founded by four computer scientists. So uh, you can generally assume that none of us knew anything about marketing which probably helped us. You know, one of the things that I did uh, really early on, I was trying to find a great tagline because naively uh, I thought, well, we need a great tagline. A firm is a wonderful name and it speaks to what we stand for, but what we need is a really catchy line. So somebody sent me this link, 1,000 taglines used by American banks. And if, if whatever you can think of that says, we are going to lend you money and you should trust us, it's already been come up with four words, five words, you know, any combination of it was sort of like dizzying array of we're on your side, we're with you, we're behind you, leading the whatever you want. And so we sort of said, you know, like this is not gonna work. Better, smarter marketers than us have already tried to inspire trust through words. We should just do it through actions. And um, So it's we, like counterintuitive. A little, sorry? It's a little bit counterintuitive. Um, yeah, it's almost like you say, you know what, you shouldn't trust us because everybody else already lied to you. No, what we did was uh, design our product to speak for itself. And so, um, one, we, you know, true story, uh, on a flight from San Francisco to New York, about five hours, I try to figure out how to compute compounding interest given an APR and a loan compounding rate in a period of time. In that five hours? In five hours. I thought it would take me 10 minutes, you know, maybe before takeoff. By the time we landed, I had looked up several online calc 